so so I, I don't know what it is about the drinking water in Hamburg, but everybody's just just rocking out with the lightning talks. Um, so first first up, and I'm gonna I'm pretty much gonna throw to Rainier almost instantly. Um, am I still in? Okay. Okay, great. Yep, right at 12.45, which we're right at now. This, uh, Rainier's talk, I messed it up yesterday. I messed up Rainier's original five-minute lightning talk yesterday. Um, and he had more content that he could fit in five minutes anyway. And, and I messed up the slides, so I felt a little bit guilty about that. So I decided the only fair thing to do was to give him 10 minutes today. So um, Rainier's going to take it off with the first talk. 10 minutes today, give him a huge round of applause, and stay tuned for a great show. Well, first of all, thank you, Nick, for being so kind to me. Uh, I, I love you, really. Um, well, as you probably have seen in the newspapers there, uh, especially in the past year, there are lots of patent wars going on, especially in, this, in the smartphone field. And it's typically it's Apple and Apple and Samsung and Apple again. And this picture gives a, f a fine overview of some of these things. I actually chose the most colorful picture I could find on the, on the internet. There are ma many of them. And I go, don't, I'm not prepared to discuss them all in detail. But there are, there are lots of fight. Keep that in mind. Well, is this, is this a matter of uh, people, uh, nasty, miserable uh, Korean people st stealing Bill Gates' brilliant uh, and, and um, Steve Jobs' brilliant, brilliant inventions? No, it's really a thing which is called, a slide please. It's something called strategic patenting, which is a phenomenon known for a long time in, in, the, in the literature. And to make things real simple, the, the, the practice is as follows. Get, if you're a party in this industry, get a zillion patents, trivial patents, it doesn't matter. And um, the first thing you can do is to eat your competitor by harassing him with, with, with these patents. And the other thing is get a, a huge patent portfolio to prevent to be, to be eaten. So it really boils down to a, 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 an arms race. And, um, well, and eventually, it's, it's like a nuclear war arms race. Mutual destruction, these words are used in the literature. And the net effect of, these, of, this, of this practice is, well, it has no effect to innovation whatsoever. You may remember the American Constitution says that the patents should foster innovation, basically. They don't. It's just a costly arms, arms race, which is bad for everyone, except uh, patent attorneys, perhaps. Well, some, some background about patents. Well, these, as I said, patents in this case don't foster innovation. There is literature saying, well, actually, they don't do in any field, patent, patents uh, are, cost more money than they provide money, except in medicine. But in, in medicine, it has been proven that they don't uh, foster innovation, that innovation is actually hampered by, by these patents. Um, it's a nice literature about that. Uh, and then p patents are associated with protection, schutz of the, uh, of the, of the earth in German. Uh, and protection sounds like something desirable, but, but, but protection is actually alien, contrary to the idea of a free market. Um, could we do something about it? Well, for the legal, from the legal part, there, is, there, is there any room to move? Well, basically, there is. I don't dive in details. And basically, oh, oh um, slides. Yeah, so, OK, it's on, on this slide. Um, so basically, you should be aware that patents are not a matter of legal logic or any way. It's, it's commercial um, policy. That, that's what the central thing is. And it's, for instance, the Chinese are very much aware of that. L lawyers complain about the Chinese, but the Ch Chinese don't, don't do the only sensible thing. They pursue their own interests. Um, but could we do anything to, to, to stop these, these, these patent wars? Well, actually, they are, uh, the risk is that they are contagi contagious and that uh, virus may spread from the United States, where this practice is uh, really strong these days, to, to Europe. Because uh, there is, well, for 40 years, they have been working on a central European patent court. And it sounds illogical that we don't have it, but it's actually a very dangerous thing. And the preparations are now in the final stage. Uh, Van Rompuy made a decision actually to establish it, and it has, has been approved. And it aims, well, this central court, it's, it sounds logically, but it aims at simplification, at cost, cost reduction, but actually it has already been proven in literature that it will be very expensive, and it will be very complicated, and it will, it will especially, it won't be, oh, I forgot to say slide again. <laughs> it, it, 
uh, so the preparations are in the final, final stage. Um, and it won't be good for EU competitiveness because, and that's a very simple thing, the, the graph shows, and if it's good, yeah, it, it, it moves indeed. It's a, it's a GIF, an old fashioned GIF, and it moves, and it shows that the, the, the bottom dark blue part are the number of European patents owned by Europeans, because that's often a confusion. European patents are patents in Europe, are not patents owned by Europeans. And actually, less than half and a decreasing part of European patents is owned by Europeans. So it has nothing to do with European competitiveness. And another thing is that, uh, well, this new court will things make, make things more competitive, more, more costly, and that will be especially detrimental to SMEs, small and medium enterprises. And uh, there is a larger percentage of these, these companies in uh, Europe than there is in, in the United States. So that's another reason why, why it will be detrimental to Europe. Well, and uh, well, if this court materializes and it's, it's five before 12, then uh, there will be a kind of one-stop shopping to extend U.S. patent wars to Europe. It, it's already happening, but it's now, well, on a, on a moderate scale because it's still divided over the, over the uh, individual countries. And uh, another thing to, to, to mention briefly is that this uh, so centralized court in the United States is a centralized patent court since 1982, and the, the people who are the, the judges that on that court, they of course, they are all proper judges and uh, objective, but they all love patents. They are crazy about patents and they are uh, addicted to patents, so they're not really objective, which they are supposed to be. Uh, slide. Um, well, is, is, this, is this really over now that uh, Van Rompuy and the European Council made this decision? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, it's, uh, there are lots of complaints and uh, even Large companies like Nokia and Ericsson, they start complaining that this is uh, this is set up. Well, it, it, it looks logical, but it, is, it isn't at all. And it will be, well, as I said, costly, complicated. Uh, Max Planck Institute in Munich pre prepared reports saying it's, it's a ridiculous thing to do. And um, you've, you'll find the documentation on this URL. And um, I would like to mention the name here of a person called uh, uh, Gérald Cédrati Dinet, also known as Jibus. And he is he's very active in this field. So watch this uh, website and see what you can do about it. Um, my own address is, is at the bottom. My experience is, and I won't repeat, it's the on patent law and especially on this on this patent fights and uh, things like that. So my my uh, name is on the bottom. And that's that's my story. Thank you. Thank you very much. And just because we have such a compressed program, we will not be taking any questions. So if you are done with what your presentation is, then we're just going to move on. Next up, um, Matthew Borgatti, who I have to download his second set of slides momentarily. And very fun. OK. Awesome. Uh, and I wasn't in the corner making the slides for this talk. Right now. No, right now. No, of course not. I wasn't doing that. That's, that, that's not what you were doing at all. That's that, not what I was doing. I'm very And it's prepared. ironic that your talk is motivated misinformation. <laughs> the, the, the talk that you were working on up until about 45 seconds ago. No, I wasn't doing that. No, 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 no. I think you were. I, I am motivated to provide accurate information, whereas you are motivated to provide inaccurate information. And I'm motivated to be right. And I don't know why I'm motivated to delete these words, but <laughs> all right, all right. It, it happens. It's coming out of your time anyway, so. Yeah, it does. Oh. OK. Um, so slides auto advance? If everything works correctly, which hopefully it will. All right. So all right. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Hold on. I have to, I have to stop. Stop. Uh. OK. It, calm yourself. It's exciting. I know, I know it's exciting. <laughs> Na, 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 na. 
So, so you know, that never makes things easier to do. <laughs> Uh, it, it, that, that's the whole point, is, is to have fun. How many people are, I could, I could actually, you know, I told them I didn't need a herald angel for this session, but it's times like these where I'm like, yeah, maybe I should have. Okay, so, Touch Kucha format, 20 slides, 20 seconds per slide. They advance automatically. If you say slide, I will ignore it. So, Matt, are you ready to go? Yeah. Your six minutes and 40 seconds starts now. Groovy. So, I'm going to be talking to you about some weird-ass digital fabrication. Essentially, I believe that design is sort of this middle endian kind of thing where you have your end goals, you have your initial ideas, and you have the materials, the resources you've got available to fit those two, that you can fit the end goals to fit your materials, you can fit your materials to fit your end goals, that it's this kind of sliding scale. And so there isn't an ideal solution, there isn't some sort of like perfect idealized thing. I mean, the, there, there's an ideal solution, and then there's what the universe actually wants to give you. You could do an amazing thing, like completely restructure your hackerspace with new furniture and all sorts of awesome things and building out of shipping crates and all that kind of stuff, but you're not going to find it. Because human resources like time, effort, energy, money, they're all finite things. You've only got so much, and you've got to plan your process around what you've got. And so it's similar to programming goals, fitting your amount of time into your amount of programming hours, what bugs you can fix. And so for me, physical object fabrication fits into the same kind of field. I use digital fabrication tools to make sure that I can get a result that I can predict and a method that I can prototype. So when I'm wrong about things, I can correct my wrongness in an iterative and prototype kind of way. So the main goal is getting to a solution that I can get to, getting to a solution that I have a known boundary for. So um, if the problem is I'm hungry, um, then making an extensive three-course meal is probably not your ideal solution. That might be the solution to a different problem like I'm bored. I have too much time on my hands. I want to experiment with new cuisine. I have a family meal coming up and I want to be prepared for it. Like, those are valid goals. Those are valid end goals. But if the question is, I'm hungry, the answer is food in face. <laughs> like, if, if I'm making something, I, if I'm making a project and my answer is, I need a working one of these, I can't wander off in the middle and being like, oh, but what's this? Uh, oh, I want to do some wax casting. That's really interesting. No, it, I have to have a focus. So what a, this project is a prototype for a piece of jewelry. Um, the idea was I ha only have so much time and so much money, and I also want to create an efficient product that looks professional that I can prototype and iterate because my initial ideas about what the fit will be, what, how it will wear, are going to be wrong. So what I did is I designed it in CAD because I can predict a lot of things about how it's going to cast, how the mold's going to get made. And so that's a 3D printed prototype a, designed to be assembled to uh, fit together, so two casts of that thing in the upper right corner go together once they're cast in metal. And so this whole process is I designed it all in CAD, so laser cut bits to fit together with 3D prototyped bits, silicone cast in it, and it makes a wax mold of something that only cost me $40. This whole process cost me $40 of materials. And the bracelet that it made is a little bit big. Oh no! Another two hours of my time and $40, and I've got a prototype that works very, very well for my process. Since it's iterative and since it's made using digital fabrication tools, oh no, my method was wrong, oh no, I made a mistake. It's, it's really trivial to go back and wind it back and make something that works. I can do it at reasonable cost if I know my method really well and I plan my method around maybe a step in my method is going to be wrong. Let's have it be flexible. So speaking of flexible things, um, this I'm working on 3D printed robots, pneumatic soft robots. And that's kind of a difficult problem based on you want to inflate a thing. You want to get a pneumatic thing to inflate. If it has seams, they're going to fight against you. If you have to seal seams, then that's going to be a nightmare. So the process that I and Jim Brett, my collaborator at MIT, have developed is we start with 3D printed powders. We have access to 3D printers. He makes powders for the 3D printers. And what happens is we have water-soluble cores that get printed, insoluble outsides that get printed. We cast the silicone in between them, and then we dissolve out the cores. This is a really early prototype. I've, got a, I've actually got a better one. It, um, I'm going to be giving a talk on it tomorrow. But what we can do is we can have a tentacle. We can have a tentacle design where we can do an arbitrary inside and keep the outside the same to get different kinds of motion. 
it's really trivial for us to make a new design on the inside and print it. So here's an even more complex one that I actually have a working prototype for. So instead of having two different volumes on either side, we have three. But the CAD for this isn't substantially different. It's not super, super different. I didn't have to spend a million hours engineering this since I already have a method that gets me to a pretty good prototyped result and the method is pretty solid. I can do things like I want to print another mold to make a silicone thing with a slight variation off of the last thing that I did. My iteration time's really fast, so this is a mold to make a mold to make a wax thing that goes inside the tentacle. And you'd be like, wow, that's insanely, that's a lot of steps in the process. No, that's actually making some CAD and having a robot hit go. I just ran the 3D printer and then 3D printed part, I cast silicone into it. I get to do other work while that cures. So I even made an alignment jig on the laser cutter because since I have it in CAD, since it's all 3D and I know exact measurements for it, for aligning the internals of the robot, I can just 3D print, laser cut, I can make alignment jigs, make my life easier through robots. So go, go boldly forward, make things, do stuff. With a knowledge of the kind of resources you have, including your own time. Things are going to screw up in your methods. That's, that's just guaranteed. New stuff has a higher chance of screw ups, but you can't rely on, well, eventually I'm gonna figure out the screw ups. You know, no matter where I pursue, explosions happen, so what? You can actually plan a method where if I have a step in my method that's wrong, I can have a flexible enough method that no matter what, it's gonna work. So, here is something that I got wrong the first time, making it way too complicated, and it got right the second time. So the first time I was like, oh, clever laser cutting thing, I'm gonna make a mold to cast a stamp into. And so I'm gonna, it, there's a Chinese restaurant near me, it has the weirdest logo ever, it's just a, a, a assemblage of clip art that kinda looks like a chef guy. And so, I thought he needed a gun. Um, <laughs> So the first method was, oh my god, complicated, blah, I'm gonna cast my own stamp. Eh. Over time, I looked on the internet and I looked up laser cut stamp and there's actually laser cut stamp rubber. I could just put it on the laser. So the thing is, sometimes you get complicated. That, that, that's it, you're done. Bye. All right. But that's also okay because you're giving the next talk. Talk number two. Starts... <laughs> This isn't the one I was working on in the corner over there, no. Uh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Okay, um, and, and, and Matt, just, just one quick note. Yeah. Uh, don't forget, uh, you, you want to make sure that you don't walk. Oh, right, yeah, I have a habit of wandering. Sorry, yeah, yeah. I so just, I mean, it, actually, if it, if it helps you, you can always just stand like this, and then when you want to see if anybody is about to throw something at you in the audience, you just turn out like that. Okay. So, so, what, so I, lo looking I'm at slides, paranoid. Looking at slides, Paranoid. All right. Okay. Good. Okay. Yes. Go. So this is a little talk just about um, I, since I own a small company, a lot of my time has been spent finding out what kind of advertising works, and I found a lot of kind of mildly terrifying to extremely terrifying things that go on in the world of advertising. Um, so specifically, motivated misinformation is the general idea that there are reasons to tell people things that aren't true. Oh my God, who realized? Um, but that there are actually tools out there in the world, expensive digital tools and simple little social tools that allow you to change what people think about facts. So um, th this particular talk is going to go, I'm going to tell you depressing things, and then I'm going to show you a kitten. So <laughs> let's, let's all go down the rabbit hole and put on our tinfoil hats and enjoy some kittens. So I'm going to start out with a story just kind of to establish how powerful misinformation can be about polio. So in Afghanistan, um, there was the highest rate of polio anywhere in the world, a, a whopping 50-something cases as opposed to the rest of the world combines 250-something. Um, 58 cases of a disease that the uh, World Health Organization considers eradicated. So it's not at a level where you can have epidemic size outbreaks without some amazing social thing happening to stop people from having immunity. So cases have been steadily increasing since the 60s in tandem with a set of meh, religious beliefs. So what has ended up happening is there are a number of people who believe that the polio vaccination campaign is a Western conspiracy to emasculate them. 
And so there are a number of people who pamphlet various neighborhoods in Afghanistan saying, be suspicious of people giving out polio vaccines. Kitten. <laughs> so th this isn't like, this isn't ma magic satellites are changing your brain. This is a measurable increase, a wild increase in polio outbreaks. Th this is measurable. You can also find the pamphlets that they're being handed out. And, and surely we're suspicious and scientific people. We cannot be subject to this brand of misinformation. So there are actually systems that are pretty much designed to advertise to you, to convince you about the nature of the world. And they're reasonably sophisticated. Google AdWords has a reasonable idea of what you like. So there's a service called Helper Reporter Out, where lazy reporters and people who want to appear in the news meet over a pay service. So Helper Reporter Out, essentially lots of people get paid by the word or by the view, and they need last minute news. There are lots of people who want a story written about them that are willing to give an interview on any topic, whether an expert or not, and it will come out in the news. Kitten. <laughs> um, I know this because I am a member of Helper Reporter Out because it's good advertisement for my company. So I give interviews on pretty much any subject that people ask me about, and people will cite me as an expert in their story. Advertising equivalent exposure is another term um, used in advertising for a news story that is as good as an ad. So there are lots of ad agencies that produce things that sound a lot like news, like scientists have found the perfect formula for a butt. This is an actual story that was on Fox News. Um, and <laughs> You can purchase news exposure. It was, a, it was a set of advertisers who went to a university with, here's a result we want. Is there any mathematical foundation behind it? And they just gave them a vague, hand-wavy answer. And the PR company said, hey, this is backed up by academics. <laughs> it's, it, there, are ac there are robust systems for doing this. This is a known problem. This happens, unfortunately, all the time in things like medicines, where you will have a company that wants people to feel a certain thing about a medicine. They don't have to actually say it, but what they can do is contact reporters with PR pieces to talk about how good the medicine is. There was actually a recent pharma company that was sued because on one page they would have an advertisement that had no particular medical claims, and on the other page there would be an editorial piece with someone saying, I took this medicine and it cured all my diseases. So there's a book called Trust Me, I'm Lying, if you're interested in this topic. Um, it was written by the ad executive of American Apparel. and it actually goes over a lot of the techniques for drifting news away from news stories and into news sensationalism. Essentially, things that catch eyes, things that catch ears, make news. And so the, the one of the kind of core tactics that uh, the author of Trust Me, I'm Lying talks about again and again is kitten. Um, <laughs> is you go up the chain. You can turn little stories into big stories by establishing a framework of small stories so that when someone Googles something, researching a story last minute on a deadline, that they will find the spectrum of your existing stories. Essentially, you can pepper local media outlets with the thing you want people to say. So what can we do? Blogs. So. Essentially, there are a lot of ways that blogs, independently written things, can be terrible and awful. But they can also be vetted. So you can start being aware of the kind of people who do their research and check up on their research, people who use open research, people who use research that actually has a medical foundation, or you can check their sources, you can find their facts, you can check their hyperlinks and decide for yourself. So there are some people who do amazing blog work and who do amazing, essentially, skeptical reporting on the news. And they essentially are subject to the same forces that make for good stories in science. They're vetted, there's open review, there's peer review. You can look at them. And so one person that's wonderful to watch, I recommend you look, follow his blog, uh, Edzard Ernst is actually the first UK professor of alternative medicine, and he publishes articles on what alternative medicines don't work at all. He is a professor of alternative medicine that spends most of his time publishing peer-reviewed articles on how alternative medicine doesn't work. This is a good guy to watch. Also, Ben Goldacre, kitten. Um, I recommend Ben Goldacre's Bad Science. He's a columnist for The Guardian, and he writes about pretty much how this kind of stuff happens, media misreporting. Last, last kitten, I mean slide. Kitten. So. Thank you very much. Go out there, be suspicious, tinfoil hats.
All right, Hugo, are you around? are you ready? Hugo? Yep. Okay, just jump right up there. Okay, and David, uh, you emailed. Are your slides here, David? Oh, okay. Where did did you just email me those slides? Uh, oh wait, may, actually maybe. Yep. I am confusing myself here. Okay, so Hugo, you're up. David, you're next. Um, this is the lightning talks. We've got plenty of seats over here, and we've got a really compressed program, and we're one minute behind, so we're just going to jump right into it, and your six minutes and 40 second Pecha Kucha talk starts now. Okay, so hello everybody, I'm Hugo. I'm going to talk about Tomes of Service Student Treat, which is a project I started this summer with uh, people from Hernosted. I am also a law student, and um, so I'm going to talk about the problem, a uh, problem which affects a lot of people who use the web every day, and uh, I think that uh, with some hacking we can pretty much fix it. So the problem is the biggest lie on the web. Uh, this lie is I have read and agree to the terms of service. So uh, of course I'm talking about uh, web services which deal with uh, our private data and uh, our creative material. Um, what is at stake is our rights and our freedoms on the web and uh, pretty much those of everybody, el of everybody else. So yeah, the, the process of acceptance is basically broken. This is a screenshot uh, from some iPhone application. The problem is that uh, legally this is contract and the contract are based on agreement. There is no real agreement as you can see because uh, the real problem is that um, we never read that stuff and we actually give up some of our rights without noticing. Uh, this can be pretty extreme, like this website. Uh, people didn't read it and they actually sold their soul to a game station, which is a game website. Okay, so this may be a prank, but sometimes it can get serious. And it was a topic from US uh, researchers and they found out that it would take uh, every person uh, 76 days every year to be able to read all the terms they agreed to online. So basically, it requires to be a full-time lawyer to use the web and know what you're dealing with. But it doesn't have to be like that. Um, we solve copyright uh, legal mess with Creative Commons, and in, in software licensing, we have um, you know, FSF and OSI labels. The problem is, who's going to fix it for you? Because it's really boring. The terms of service of iTunes are longer than Hamlet, and uh, quite frankly, I prefer to read Hamlet than reading uh, this kind of shit. So what we need is um, some tools, some organization, and a bit of hacking. Um, one project that I really like is the Mozilla Privacy Icons, and I would like to you know, mix it with Terms of Service, didn't you? Icons are pretty cool to convey message, which are easy to understand. And um, the problem is that they are very, there, is, there is a very large number of issues that are being dealt with Terms of Service. It's not as simple as Creative Commons. I mean, simple. Even Creative Commons can get pretty complicated if you have too many uh, icons. But if you have too many icons, it defeats the purpose because it becomes also difficult to understand. Um, this is a database of some of the most common terms that you can find in the terms of service. And you, you've got about 160 variations. So you cannot do 160 icons, obviously. So this is where Terms of Service didn't read comes in. Uh, we try to make uh, easy to understand uh, text summary with icons which are nice uh, to uh, give a balance um, between what's really bad and what's really good. So it's basically a rating system that we give. Um, the goal is to you know, increase awareness of our rights online and also give people the ability to compare services so we can give a better, um, um, we, we can show people that free software based alternatives are better than you know, uh, Facebook or whatever. Uh, of course the project is free software so you can fork it and make it about uh, a project, uh, something specific like a terms of service about uh, mobile operators or internet services. We also have a browser extension which I hope you can uh, install. Um, so let's talk a, bit, a little bit about the content of the terms that some of the nasty stuff that you can find in those uh, texts. Uh, obviously copyright is a big issue because a lot of these services uh, deal with uh, our own um, creative materials, so uh, pictures, uh, uh, text, uh, whatever. 
Um, well, if you think about you know the goal of copyright, I mean, <laughs> it's supposed to be the goal. Um, it's to you know promote um, um, you know public benefit. And if you look at these terms, they, there is no public benefit at all. There's, it's only everything is in, in, for the the, cop, the corporations. Nobody really benefits from this. Uh, this is um, the terms of service uh, from Facebook. Uh, this is the copyright license in the terms. Uh, basically, it's so broad, it's a bit complicated if you don't understand what each word means, but it's basically, hey, we're Facebook, give us all the rights on your pictures. So we also try to connect uh, some of the different clauses that you can find, and we give thumbs down so that people understand this is bad compared to what other, people, other services can do. Um, the other very big issue that uh, we uh, watch is how the terms can change because in the terms you usually have a part saying something like, oh, okay, we can, you know, anything, anytime, we can change the terms, you won't even be notified. Sometimes you find things like that. So, you know, if, even if you read the terms one day, maybe in two days they have changed and you don't even know about it. So, <clears throat> we, we need, um, well, we need to really fix this problem. Um, we've there's a lot of services to watch. So we've developed um, a tool which is called uh, Tossback. I mean, actually, we uh, continued the development which was started by the EFF. And uh, there is uh, Jim who is working on it in uh, version 3 of Tossback. So Tossback tracks all the, the, the terms of service online and, and make diffs of them so we can easily watch for the uh, evolution of those. Uh, of course, uh, as usual, it's, it's, everything is open data and the software is on GitHub. Um, if, you, you know, if you're interested in helping, uh, I really hope you can uh, contribute. Um, it's also some web development and uh, things like that. Uh, maybe not too exciting for... Um, cryptographic hackers or whatever. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so if you, is my contact address, here's the Twitter of the project, or this is the mailing list where everybody can contribute and, and, and say, hey, hello, I was reading the terms of, uh, I don't know which service, and I found this thing which was pretty weird, so yeah, what do you think? Thank you. Hey. All right, Christian, you're ready. Up next, and uh, and then Michelle, here, here. Oh. Hey, when that happens. Um, so, David, you ready to go? Yeah. Okay. And your six minutes and forty seconds starts now. Okay. My name is uh, David Burgess. I'm from a company called Range Networks. Uh, Oh, thank you. Um, if you've heard of OpenBTS, Range Networks, well, Range Networks is actually the company behind OpenBTS. I'm going to talk about the, Burning, the test network that we ran in Burning Man 2010. Um, oh, and I'm talking too fast. <laughs> but um, you know, what is OpenBTS? OpenBTS is an implementation of the GSM Air interface, but we don't use a conventional GSM core network. We use an all, all voice over IP core network based on SIP. So it's, it looks like an ordinary UM interface to handsets, but the back end of it looks, um, you know, your switch can be Asterisk or Free Switch or Yate or something like that. A uh, fully populated OpenBTS network looks something like this. Um, the, network topology, the network architecture is really more similar to IMS, so it allows you to build mixed networks of 2G, 3G, and 4G equipment all on the same core network. Um, there are a lot of costs, a lot of costs and operational advantages to doing this for carriers. So the other question, what's Burning Man? Burning Man is an event where about 50,000 people gather on a dry lake bed in the Nevada desert and they build a city. Um, it's, it's a city that's built, brought, and brought, built, and run entirely by volunteers, not unlike this Congress in a lot of ways. Um, the culture of Burning Man is really one of volunteerism. Uh, self-reliance, participation. It's also a very big hacker and maker event. Most people don't think of Burning Man as a hacker event, but it's probably the biggest hacker event in the world. And there's a huge maker community that comes out to this place. Um, so if you're a hacker or a maker, you should consider going. Um, okay, why run a test network there? 
Uh, what, are, what Burning Man affords us from a, from a radio operating standpoint, it affords us an area of about 10 square kilometers where we can set up full-size towers and run things at full power and pretty much own the environment. Um, radio propagation follows roughly the hottest suburban model once the city is built out and filled with shipping containers. It also gives us a population of several thousand potential test unit users who have very low expectations. So it's okay if you break things. <laughs> Uh, I mean, a lot of people, if they can make one or two phone calls, they get thrilled and bring you a case of beer. It's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's just a wonderful, fun place to do this stuff. Um, the participants in this year's networks, again, Range Networks, TIER is a group at UC Berkeley that works on technologies for the developing world. Tropo is a company that builds software for big IVR systems, including systems at Deutsche Telekom. And MedWeb is a telemedicine company based in San Francisco. Uh, so these were the companies that actually uh, participated in this network. But of course, Burning Man is violently anti-commercial. So you never use the name of your company openly at Burning Man. Instead, we operate under the name Papa Legba, which is the voodoo loa who mediates between humanity and the unseen world. Um, and we have the stickers that we put on our phones. It makes them work better. Uh, um, if you actually read the source code, there are actually references to Papa Legba in the source code. We had participants from five countries in our camp this year. Um, previous years, we've also had participants from Israel and, and Australia. Um, Burning Man is, there, there actually is a pretty large international turnout for Burning Man, so you won't be the only Europeans there if you go. Um, the topology of our network for Burning Man is actually very simple. We run a centralized switch, and we have a bunch of base stations distributed out across the, the playa, across the event site. Uh, they all get routed back to a central switch, and then from that central switch, we route calls in and out of the, you know, the big outside world, mostly through voice over IP carriers. Uh, and Tropo provided most of that connectivity this year. Um, our backhaul is provided by a group called Internet at Burning Man. This is their main tower. You can see the microwave links at the top. They run a pair of, they run um, some uh, 40 megabit microwave links back to the outside world. And they also run a ubiquity, uh, 5 gigahertz ubiquity Air Max network that's used as a, as a backbone. We had some good applications we ran this year in our network. We had some called NAT for phone numbers that would set up a temporary, a temporary working caller ID for your outbound call so people could return your call if they called within a reasonable period of time. And we also had some SMS mailing list applications. They work just like regular mailing lists, but they use SMS, so they work with cheap feature phones. Um, we first did this in 2008. Our equipment was pretty primitive. We took just basically bolted a bunch of components on a sheet of plywood in a tent. Um, we've, we've gotten better. By 2012, we were using much more professional packaging and much more professional equipment, um, which is one of the advantages of actually having a company and having revenue and money and you can do things properly now. Um, so this is, you know, this is a, you know, equipment that Range Networks brought out there. We had five units like this installed in different places with different packaging options. And, you know, we had some voice over IP phones and the Raspberry Pis in there for street cred. Um, we're actually running a lot of stuff off of that. This is a typical installation, outdoor installation. This is at the airport. They actually, Burning Man actually has an FCC certified airport. I mean, FAA certified airport. Um, this was our tower site at the airport. It's a temporary mast. We have the nano bridge, and we have the equipment's actually mounted up on the pole to keep cable loss pretty low. So this is a largely self-contained site. This is another site at a camp called Plagon Village. They had a pre-existing 30-foot steel frame truss, steel truss tower. Um, they were using for an FM radio station, and we just bolted our stuff up there. This was actually one of the big, busiest tower sites in our, in our installation in the whole city. This was one of the busiest sites. This is just a single Arfkin 2-watt base station. Uh, we used um, some trucks with pneumatic mast for some of this stuff. Uh, we ended up not liking them very much because of high cable loss. The high flex cables used on the pneumatic mast um, are actually high loss. But we, you know, the trucks were available, we were using them, and we weren't particularly happy with the performance we got off of them. So this is our coverage map. Um, you can see the metric scale at the bottom. These are our five sites, and these are the coverage. The two blue circles are pole-mounted outdoor units. The two smaller red circles were trucks with pneumatic mast, and the larger red circle was our main camp where we're running a two Arfkin system off of a 30-foot steel truss tower. So we covered most of the city except for a small hole around 730. Anyway, if you want more information, here are some links. If you want to get in touch with me directly through email or Twitter, there's the information. And uh, thank you very much for your time.
Oh, it sounds like home, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, that's that was... oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yep, sorry about that, yeah. Did, oh, wow, two Christians right next to each other. I, that's the first time I've noticed that. I apologize for that. Do you want to go first? Let, let's not make things complicated. Okay. You're six minutes and 40 seconds. If I have the right Christian, do I have the right Christian? Yes. Okay, awesome. You start now. Hi, uh, my name's Christian Kortnorst. Uh, I come from Ireland, um, from uh, Hackerspace in Dublin, uh, TOG, and um, we have a few thousand ducks. Um, my talk is not about ducks, but uh, they're kind of our mascot. Um, it's about flames. I'm going to talk about four projects that I built with another member, um, and kind of what you need to do, and how easy it is to do, and I'm not really going to talk about the safety much, but, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, um, we have friends in the scrapyard, so that's an ideal place to get uh, a lot of the steel and a lot of uh, the, the bits and pieces. First project, Rubens Tube. It's a three meter long, uh, the Rubens Tube is a flaming synthesizer. So it's a large, large uh, six inch diameter tube um, that has 150 holes drilled along the top. You pump gas into it and uh, then you light it and you get a very, very neat um, uh, kind of candles along the top. You'll see photos later on. Um, so this is, we, we use two bollards uh, that they use for stopping cars driving through. We welded them together and then cut off one end. And um, there's a diaphragm on one end made out of a rubber uh, handle, or sorry, a, a rubber glove. So we cut that and stuck it on and mashed it together a bit. So this is the results. You'll see that the sine wave that comes out of the, so there's a speaker on one end, um, and that uh, then pipes music through it. And then the sine wave that comes out is trapped. The next one, uh, uh, we made a, a homemade uh, forge or foundry. Um, and don't do this without cleaning it out first, obviously. Um, we, it stinks to hell. You drill a hole in the top, you drill a hole in the bottom, and um, then we washed it out with hot water, but it was it certainly smelly. Um, again, you can see the kind of fire extinguishers using those. Um, th we, that was the main part to hold uh, the aluminium, and then we used the we just cut off the lid uh, or the top, and that was the lid. So. Um, you kind of you need gas, so there's a flare that we had to make. It's a, a, a bit of coke can, <laughs> um, a bit of a tube, and then a flare made out of the top. Um, so there's a few different designs. This is the design we went with, um, and the coke can is just to baffle the air that goes in and out. Um, this was the big mistake. Uh, you can see the one on the right. Uh, don't do this. Um, <laughs> concrete, a lot of water in concrete, metal plate, a lot of heat, trapped, boom. Um, <laughs> the one on the left was a bit better, so uh, we, we kind of learnt as we went along. Um, every project that I build kind of takes a day or two. You know, if, if it takes longer than a day or two, I don't do it really. That's that's kind of the gist of it. Um, we were able to cast aluminium. We were able to make uh, glass go all floppy. Um, and we used en engineered bricks. That was another thing. We should have used fire bricks. Um, and that's uh, where another bit of explosion happened. Blacksmithing Forge. Um, I went on a blacksmithing course, uh, again, a one-day event. Uh, saw how easy it was. They had some homemade makeshift stuff. Bit of tube, blower, coals on top. Um, and um, that, that's what we made. Uh, and again, it was made in a few hours. And uh, we, we've improved since then. So the blower is off an old uh, oil burner. Um, so we're making, making improvements as we go along. That's the first slide I haven't missed. Uh, yeah. Next one, uh, fl uh, flamethrower. So this is an ongoing project. I've only I've built one, um, and the idea was, uh, huh, wouldn't it be funny if flames came out of fire extinguisher? <laughs> um, 
and it, it, it's it's pretty impressive. Um, so I'll go through the, what you do is you get a fire extinguisher, take off the top, extend the top um, of it so that it just has kind of a nozzle coming out the top, air nipple in the bottom, pipe in your gas, and uh, then you light the top of it, and uh, you just put a, a small little uh, pilot light at the top, and whenever you pull down the handle. Uh, the next step um, for this is to automate it and connect it to a drum kit. So four drums, f four flaming uh, torches, and uh, hitting one after the other. So we're kind of expand. That's just a piece from a car uh, cable tied. Uh, it's the uh, what what pulls up and down. Um, <laughs> So we, we got a, a slow motion camera, there's some videos on tog.ie of it, um, and there's some amazing shots of it. Uh, so. Now I have um, questions, also I have two slides, just in case anybody has questions. Um, these are other projects that I'm into, again, kind of quick and kind of dirty. I, I'm not tongue count myself as a, a perfectionist at all, but I get things done. Uh, can crushers, uh, screen printing and things like that. Uh, any questions? Yes? What's 100 divided by 3? <laughs> I, I don't know. Please repeat the question. Uh, what's 100 divided by 3? No, not you, him. Uh, oh. What, what's 100 divided by 3? Anybody else want to answer that? Uh, any good questions? <laughs> nope. I get off lightly. Yeah, if oh, I may. Yeah. Do you ever use stuff like flame arresters just to make sure more explosions don't happen? Yeah, one. Uh, question. Please repeat. Oh, the sorry. Uh, do we ever use uh, flashback arresters? Um, yeah, we've we, we've bought uh, a few, and and they're on the likes of the Rubens tube. So a flashback arrester, it just stops the flame going back down the tube. So that's that's, and we we do we 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 use welding gear and stuff to to hold, and and we do wear goggles and things like that. So the, the general. You're done. All right. Thank you very much. H huge round of applause for all of the lightning talk presenters. All right, now the other Christian, if your slides decide to load, which of course they won't. Okay. Let, let me just get a quick second to make sure. Is this your second slide? Yes, yes, that's my second oh, slide. Okay, I, I'll, I will attempt to compensate. Pecha Kucha is really one of the hardest formats to do. Um, Christian, I love the idea of the ducks. That was really awesome. Uh, save it for next year. Matt, thank you for leading us off. And hopefully this will work. So Christian, go ahead and introduce yourself. Your six minutes and 40 seconds. The slides may be slightly delayed, it appears, but, but I know Christian will do good sub. So 640 starts now. So hi, my name is Christian, and I will present some experience I have uh, I had with weather balloons and small rockets. Uh, if I screw it up in English, I might change to German, uh, where I'm more secure and safe. But all the slides are uh, in English. Uh, so we will start with the weather balloons. Um, it's uh, it has come on, uh, really mainstream. We see people launching iPhones and everything, but I I did build my own. So this is a, a typical setup. We have the balloon filled with helium. Uh, before it bursts, uh, it has a diameter of, uh, of about uh, 10 meters. Now it's two meters. Then the parachute, uh, the radar uh, reflector. That's very important because uh, with the reflector, the, the the ground control and the planes can see you. And then at the end, you see the payload. It's a little cube. Um, to the size of the, the cube, it was uh, uh, they told me that it had to be a minimal size, so the, the half of the thing is filled with air. Um, but there, in, inside, you have to put all your experiments, uh, power, uh, uh, telemetry, yeah. So that's when it, when it goes up, so it uh, uh, flies with about five meters per second uh, uh, towards the space. Uh, and normally uh, the balloon bursts at about, I don't know, 25, 30 kilometers, depending on the quality of the balloon. Um, 
Yeah, so what are the challenges that we are, uh, have building a, a balloon like this? We have uh, very low temperatures, very, very low air pressure. Uh, the weight, uh, the maximum weight was 2.5 kilos. Uh, the tracking and telemetry, it has to be reliable because uh, if it doesn't work, you don't find it, like me. <laughs> Someone else found it six months later in the, in the woods. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, the public authorities, everything has to be clear. You have to have the, the launch authorization, the cost, how much does it cost? And at the end, uh, the environment, what happens, for example, if my balloon falls into the sea? Does it uh, pollute the water? Do the fish die because of the battery? I don't know. Uh, this is a picture from about uh, 25 kilometers high. So most of people ask me, which camera did you use? Uh, I used a normal PowerShot Canon camera with the Canon hack development kit on it. So it can run scripts, so it takes a picture every 30 seconds. Um, yeah, uh, most of people ask me, yeah, but does it really work in the cold? And uh, at this height, uh, the temperature is about uh, zero degrees. But first, on the sensors, you have to choose them wisely, not like me. <laughs> uh, the, the pressure dropped uh, below 150 kilopascals. My sensor did stop, like the temperature did drop under 40 degrees. Uh, my, my sensor didn't record it, so I was very angry at me afterwards. Uh, and you re really have to look what you expect and choose the sensors wisely. Um, this is uh, the tra trajectory mapped with, with uh, Google, Ma uh, Google Earth. It's, it's a really cool program with, for that. You can view it, you can analyze it. And uh, so uh, to use it in Google Maps, I had to do some tricks with exporting it with Excel and in other formats so if uh, he, he eats it. And uh, it even has cool functions like uh, showing a, a graph. This is uh, the height uh, and the speed, the ground speed. So the maximum speed was 130 kilometers on the ground uh, while it was uh, falling down again. Um, this is a cool function. I never thought it would have Google Earth, but uh, you can choose it. So next, rockets. This is one of the small rockets I, I had built. Uh, you see the tube, uh, the nose cone, then some electronics with a sensor, SD card, and uh, an Arduino for opening the, the parachute door. Uh, so the next question here, what are here the challenges we have when you build one? Uh, there are many, and I still haven't uh, uh, solved them all. So you have the high thrust. Uh, forces with the two 8 or 22 Gs are applying on all the, the rocket. The launch vibrations, things can break. <laughs> that was uh, a problem once. The, the, the battery contact did break. <laughs> the, the rocket uh, did fl fly without any power. Um, and other problems like RF power, security of the launch area, and uh, at last, your own security. You don't want to build a rocket which flies into the public area. That's not really cool. Um, so these are the cool pictures, but uh, later we will see uh, other pictures where I failed. Why did I fail? Um, uh, I'm trying to find the right, uh, uh, the right building, because uh, most of the time, uh, the, the, in the next slide, you will see the parachute door breaks because of the vibrations, and it falls apart. The parachute oh, uh, burns in the flames, and I never found this rocket again, because it, it did fly somewhere, it dropped in the... Uh, in the woods, and uh, I, I couldn't find it. Yeah, you see it. <laughs> it opens, and it was burned uh, later. So um, you have to really. Uh, other common problem was not mine, but somebody did fix a PCB uh, uh, vertically, and during startup, uh, some parts did uh, did break and fall down into the rocket. Um, and uh, yeah, and <laughs> these are other pictures while breaking apart. Uh, the thing was, you have really have to fix it. Uh, if you want to recover the rocket in good shape, you have to fix everything. On the right picture, the electronics wasn't really fixed very hard. And uh, when it uh, fall in the ground, uh, everything went in the front and it crashed. And uh, yeah, it looked like this afterwards. <laughs> uh, so that was not very cool, because if you have an SD card or something with uh, data on it, it's really disappointing. But um, this was two years ago. Last year it did fall down, but uh, I think it didn't break, but I didn't found it. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, other problems and uh, uh, advice I can give you stay in the legal zone. That's really, uh, you can get really big problems if you launch any rockets and it hits a man or a plane or it falls on the street. I don't know. Telemetry, a ham radio license is cool, but you can't do it, uh, can't do it without. People are doing it with iPhones and telemetry or SMS. Safety first, even, and the last point, uh, organize yourself. Uh, this is the thing at the launch areas. We uh, write all the cases and scenarios that could happen uh, when this falls apart, when this light open. Really prepare yourself for every uh, occasion so you don't have to think 
on the, the spot. These are some other cool projects. Uh, uh, yeah. So, uh, how you can contact me? Uh, I think the easiest thing is you can find me in the lounge area on the fourth floor or somewhere in the talks. I don't know. Uh, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, you can ask me. Um, just to, so we are currently, blah, 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 okay, so we are, it looks like we're two minutes behind. Um, Tomas, are you in the room? Yeah. Tomas, you're good? Are you right? I, okay, good. So you're up on deck. And the internet paradox. Oh, I can't get rid of that loading thing, but uh, are you good? Okay. Okay, it should, should disappear. Your 640 starts now. Okay, uh, my name is Michi Lenaars. Uh, I work for a charity called Analyze Foundation. Uh, we fund lots of uh, internet technologies. We go back to the 80s where we uh, were the organization that introduced TCP IP in, in, in Europe. Um, uh, and we, we kind of fund uh, all the way in the stack, all the way from the root servers of the internet all the way up to browser plugins. Uh, you see a, a number of projects that we funded here from Tor hidden services to GNUnet, OpenBTS, unhosted NoScript, Anonymous Server. <laughs> This is all stuff probably, you know, uh, just to know where we come from because we found out there's a common problem attached to all of these and, and we only found out after 15 years of funding everywhere down the stack. And the problem is that everybody thinks of the internet as a great and innovative place and I mean we see all these new things added every day. And the problem is that is in a way it's true but in a way it's not true because if you look down another layer. The, the, the core services of the internet haven't changed for 20 years. Basically, we get our PHP, our MySQL, our 10 email addresses. If we get a, uh, if we go to an ISP, we get we have to upload our files with FTP. And the only thing that happens is that we get services that are added by external third parties that we can use, and those are innovative. But the internet itself is basically stuck uh, in base one. Look at all these things, and why are they not happening? It is because basically. They're too difficult for people to add. Um, and the problem is that the, the, the internet is, is, is scaled in a, in, a, in a very weird way. We have uh, 2 billion people on it. We have 240 million domain names. And it's just that nothing has ever made it that wide uh, because we depend on uh, a manual labor to do it. So not a single technology that you saw on the list has actually made it internet wide in the, in the last 20 years. And, and that's because there's a, a big gaping hole between, between us, the avant-garde that does all the cool kids uh, stuff, and, uh, and, and, and the real world. Just as a thought experiment, could we introduce email today? If we invented email today, even we know it's a working model, but we, couldn't, we could introduce Gmail. That we could, but we couldn't introduce email. So the, the model is broken. The model where we, we, we have a couple of companies that, that provide us with these services. And what is causing this? Well, we think it's the hosting companies. There's a price war going on there. I mean, I, I saw here in Germany, 64 cents a month, zero cents a month. There's a price war and nobody's investing. Everybody's just running their PHP 5 with their front page extensions. And I mean, th these are the, the, the contemporaries, the Tamagotchi and the Netscape. We, we lost them all. So if you multiply, I mean, that seems like a non-significant problem, but if you multiply it by two, mil two billion internet users and 200 million domain names, all of a sudden the internet stops. It doesn't do anything. It's the only the first million domain names move. Yeah, right. But the big volume does it. So there's this hosting, uh, the cheap hosting is a major bottleneck for everything that we want because IPv6, we know it's necessary. Asian people can't get on the internet because th there's no more numbers. There's only four and a half billion. They're sparsely uh, uh, given. So they can't get on it decently. But we're hogging uh, the innovation because we don't need it. The hosting pl providers don't need it. So uh, just as an, an analogy, I mean, this is the firmware that's built into the common internet. And the problem is we shouldn't expect people to tamper with firmware. We shouldn't expect people to go into the DNS and then fix stuff for themselves. All of us can do it. The problem is the big volume doesn't do it. And, and, and that's hurting us. That's hurting us tremendously because uh, uh, as soon as we, as the, 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 the digerati or the people that know don't fix it for others than ourselves, uh, we end up with a lot of shit. 
And that shit has a couple of names. Twitter, Facebook, Skype. I mean, those are pseudo systems, pseudo infrastructure where you're basically you have, a, you, you, you get an identity from them. Look at a company like Microsoft. They give you Skype, they give you Hotmail, they give you Outlook.com, and in every of those services, you have a different identity. We have two billion people trying to fit into this cramped space. And your identity is fragmented all over the place. And that basically, it sucks deep and it's not necessary because we all have proper identification. We have 240 million domain names. Uh, we own the internet. We have identities there that work. So instead of having all these unlinked identities, why don't we use our domain names to to, to do it. And we're actually paying these hosting companies for hosting. 140 character publishing isn't that difficult. So why can't I follow people on their email address? Why can't I send them like a 100 megabyte file on their email address? Why don't we have the protocols up already? We know the, we know the protocols. <laughs> and the, the same goes for federated social web and all these things. We, we know how it works. We have the, the code, it's there. It's just nobody has ever bothered to, to package it together and to give it to ISP, say, good, this will fit in your 10 gigabytes a month. This doesn't cost any processing, it's dirt cheap. So why don't we fix it? There's, there's a huge potential because even with the two things that are, are working, uh, web and email, there's a lot wrong. I mean, people get spam, and it's because we haven't used SPF and DKIM, which are two technologies to basically prevent spam from, uh, from uh, at least Joe jobbing from occurring. Uh, so we have to fix certain things. We have to, to, to add new stuff. The, the new stuff is, uh, uh, um, well, this whole list. I'm not going to even bother reading it, but it's there's there's just such a shitload of things that hundreds of millions of users are using that we have open alternative source standards based. It's been mature, developed, 100 million users, and still we're not getting it because the hosting companies are doing it. So what is the vision that we have? Is basically that the user controls its own identity and we can retrieve it from in in, in a way backwards. So I don't have to go to Facebook and ask, do you know a user named Michi Lenax? No, you can actually go to an identity that you know of me, private, personal, or business identity, and then see what services I'm using. Just turn it around. So this is our basic master plan, which ends in restoring world order. Um, for those that don't get this in 20 seconds, I have a, uh, a, a neat version which I'll put out uh, on, on, a, on a brochure on the outside. But it's basically all the components are there. So why don't we bloody well do this? Uh, and, uh, yeah, and that's about it. Well, that's six minutes and 40 seconds. So if you have any questions, uh, come and talk to me uh, or, or go to that website. We just put it up today. It's a, it's a premiere, so uh, b bear with us if we're like writing stupid things and correct us instead of burning us down because we're, I, 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 we, we think we're onto something here. That's it. Okay, just a couple of quick reminders. Um, if all of you guys that are stuck back there by the door, we always have plenty of open spaces here, as that bottle reminded me. As you're leaving, please pick up a piece of trash to take with you, uh, especially a bottle on the floor so it doesn't resonate. Uh, we're in the middle of the Pecha Kucha section of the talks. It's 20 slides, 20 seconds per slide. I believe we are... Okay, we are now three minutes behind, so without any further ado, Pecha Kucha, go. Okay, hi, on the, hi, my name is Tomasz, and I'm working uh, as a security engineer. Uh, I will tell you about the DNS invalid packets, so packets that are, are from one point invalid and one point invalid. Uh, we, I, I guess it is, it is not a new topic, so in Poland we call it a reheated pork, so. Uh, f okay, first, what is a d DNS name? DS na DNS name is a set of DNS labels separated with adults. Everybody know that. We can use uh, any amount of names, and this is defined by RFC, of course. Uh, what is a d DNS label? Uh, DNS label can uh, is can consist. Uh, any kind of characters from this this set, so we have a from a from a to z, from zero to nine, and this is case insensitive, and we can ha also have uh, have a dash inside. Uh, and then it is also defined in the R RFC, so this is not a new for uh, everyone. So what we have inside DNS answer packets? So we have a resource record, and each resource record con contains name from the query type, class, TTL, and R data. 
and I was wondering what we can put inside our data. What and did do the RFC define our data? And yeah, RFC defines uh, our data is a variable length string of octets, so we can just put it uh, put there anything, and the format varies according to the type and class. So um, if we have a uh, for example, if we have a uh, type A, we have an IP address. A, three, uh, for A means we will have a IP, IPv6, and we have, if we have a P, P, uh, PTR record, we will have a DNS, DNS name in the air data. And how does, does the air data looks like uh, if we have the DNS name inside the air data? So we have the number of bytes, the bytes, number of bytes, bytes, and the, 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 this pattern repeats. And at the end, we have the zero. Uh, at, the pa at the parsing section, the number of bytes are uh, replaced with dots, and we have the full DNS name uh, revealed from the resource record. And the important thing is that bytes should uh, be a valid DNS label. So we, we expect that. In this place, uh, we we should have the from A to Z and zero nine, uh, nothing else. So my question was, what happened if we put anything in those bytes? So uh, I start a project called Agree. You agree? I don't know if you spell it in English. Ugly responder. So uh, I will be able to put anything in the, those bytes because uh, normal DNS servers forbid to, to do that. Uh, so the first, first version of, uh, of my software, uh, this is the f piece of the configuration file. I was able to uh, almost put al almost anything, so binary data, uh, any character, any, any, um, any amount of dots, and et cetera, et cetera. So how does it look in the, in the real life? Uh, if you are using, using a Linux and, and using a glibc, glibc, for example, to get the reverse name of the IP address, you are safe because the glibc is validating the name and you, uh, you will not get any trash. But uh, what happened if you are using a Windows? So if you are, for example, run at sysinternal TCP view, you will, get, you will get a lot of trash inside the, uh, inside the remote address if you, are enable, if you enable the resolve resolve uh, IP to, uh, to the NS name. And yeah, for, from the first feeling, uh, everything, everything you can do is just get a fancy text. So you can, I can, I can uh, put the here uh, low, no reverse DNS, nothing, nothing special. But uh, in, the second, uh, in the second look, we can, for example, put a, a, a space. Three, two, one, yeah. We have the spaces here, so uh, again, nothing special. But uh, the the output of the nets that look uh, look little uh, malformed. Uh, but we, uh, we you all can see that I also put a line break here. So if someone is logging the netstat output into the file, you will probably get uh, something terrible in your output file, and you will not be able to parse it using any any of your scripts normally. And the question is, what we can do more with this? So uh, there was a Polish uh, movie called Hacker, and they were just hacking send mail using the Emacs. So this is a, just a local joke. And I was wondering, OK, how, where, where, where can I put my uh, DNS answers and, and accept, uh, expect uh, any interesting results? Uh, so I found, uh, I came with an idea, OK, let's maybe do a XSS using a DNS. So DNS is really, really at the bottom of the network, and XSS is in, in the browser in the user end. Is it possible? Uh, yes, of course. We just need to find a good place to do it. So I found one very, very popular. Uh, you have network tools, and if you do the DNS query of your ad AP address and your PTR record contains some invalid data, you will get uh, XSS. So I place a uh, line and line break here and get this, this executed by my browser. So the, the question is what we can do more with this and this, is pro this probably 
uh, opens a lot of new vectors of attacks. For example, if you think about very complex uh, administrative back front ends that are uh, displayed in using HTML and uh, using uh, I don't know a lot of DNS uh, information to, to show to show to the user, for example, to um, to show what uh, what is the country from. Uh, for, or for the IP address, so we have the network UI. Uh, we can uh, do a log malformation. For example, we can try to do a SQL injection. And if you have any experience in this matter or want to talk about it, uh, you can contact me using email, or I'll, I'll be outside the doors just at the end of the presentation. So thank you. All right, it looks like we are still three minutes behind, but doing pretty all right. Uh, everything good? Yep. All right, go for it. So uh, I'm now Eric Bienstein. I'm going to talk to you about uh, a telephony project, a uh, hardware telephony project I have been doing uh, with our team for the last uh, three years. We're building a, an open source uh, IPBX, uh, all-in-one IPBX for small office and home office. And these are the prototypes. And uh, well, this is the real deal. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit of history, uh, what, uh, what we're doing for, for doing something completely uh, open source on the uh, software and hardware side and uh, how it works, what's, what's in the box and the status. So a little bit of history, maybe if you're old enough, you remember that I was not born yet. Uh, it's, <laughs> It's an old Metra IPBX, uh, uh, an old Metra PABX, so it's all analog telephony, it's really big. And nowadays we don't use this stuff anymore, no, we have IP and internet, and uh, it's really fun, so, so we're using other protocols. Uh, but the transition is not completely finished, and uh, even though some telephone, some telcos try to, uh, try to stop doing ISDN and all this stuff because it's a bother, uh, well, uh, it's still the, the cheapest way to get a reliable connection for a company. So uh, the, the normal solution for a small company buying uh, an IPBX is they will, uh, a free software based IPBX is they, they will buy a PC and very, very expensive telephony cards and it will be like uh, very expensive. And we're trying to turn to, to change that uh, by building uh, an all-in-one solution that uh, will enable a, a small company or an, a home office or hacker space to uh, to answer all their telephony needs uh, with just one simple and open hardware solution. So it's uh, it's open hardware. Uh, one important thing. Uh, one important thing is that we we have we attach importance to the ethics of, of producing electronics, and we think that it's not possible to to produce ethics ethically produce electronics if we don't know where it comes from. So we're producing locally, and as I'm French, we're pure producing in France. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard about OHN Day. It's a a label uh, for open hardware. Uh, the the principle is that we kind of taking a sticker on the on the thing and saying it's open hardware and you can find the source here and the sources are GPLD3 because my company loves GPLD3. One time I was asking a, a, a salesperson of my company, why are you always saying GPLD3, GPLD3? And he said, I didn't know, they just told me to do that. Uh, so it's GPLD3. Um, okay, and the only non-free thing uh, inside is a firmware blob uh, running on our uh, system on chip because well uh, the chips are not free and that's that's pretty much what we call them get uh, get to be free but all the rest is free you can get the source on oh, 0001 0001 dot and dot o uh, that's kind of the point of ohende um, so right uh, let's take a look at uh, how it works uh, if the slide Changes, yeah. So, so this is kind of what's inside. Um, 
and this is a real deal. So it's uh, it's a, it's kind of like a PC. It's based on a x x86 architecture. Um, it's it's a sock produced by Intel that I think we very few in the world to use, and I'm always already on the software architecture. So uh, the the goal is using a simple asterisk based solution. Uh, my company is producing an asterisk based solution, so that's what we're using on our server. And on the kernel space side, uh, well, we developed some drivers that use some Intel code and some non Intel code for for the, for working on all the chips. And on the uh, on the firmware side, on the boot firmware side, I, I mean the BIOS, uh, we used a, a free software project called Core Boot um, to to replace the another you know, standard stack that you will use on your your standard PC to boot up your PC that has a lot of uh, non-free software and that. Uh, well, uh, the, at the time where I did this drawing, it was before uh, everybody was talking about the EFI bootlock stuff. So, uh, no, this is an example. And we're replacing the EFI stuff with uh, Core Boot. Uh, and I guess there are some people from uh, the Core Boot community here because they're, they are basically German. <laughs> Uh, and so we did some support for Core Boot. It works very well, um, and we have uh, we have arrived at a working hardware. This is a this is a working prototype. We have already some prototypes running, uh, and we're trying to to get more prototypes going to uh, hacker spaces and school and stuff. And we have a production for the the real deal on the way. Um, the project is not completely terminated, uh, completely finished on the f software and firmware side. We have a lot of unclean code that we still have to send upstream, but uh, it's going well. And uh, well, we need some get some software for for flashing. Uh, so this is the, the the status of the project is that it's technically working. Um, it's not finished, but it's technically working. And uh, the, def the, the we're not sure about what development effort is going to be put in the project in the future. So if you want to, to help, uh, please talk to me. Uh, you can contact me at uh, no, uh, my mail address. And um, yeah, please come and see me. Thank you very much. All right, as a reminder for those of you joining us, um, we are in the lightning talks. We're going to go without a break straight through till uh, 1500. Um, and then up next, if you, uh, another quick reminder, if you need information on what is happening or contact information or links from any of the presentations, they are available on the wiki at events.ccc.de. Um, there's a link to the wiki at that page, and from there, there's a link to the lightning talks. We are in day three, and we are about to enter the regular lightning talk round, uh, two minutes behind schedule. Uh, but Rami, are you ready to go? Yep. Okay, excellent. So now we are back into the five-minute lightning talk round, where slides do not auto advance automatically, and you must ask for a slide if you want it to, to proceed. Um, also, when we reach time, we're going to very silently wrap, ramp up from 10 into the buzzer sound. We'll practice that very, very quickly, so. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and. Okay, excellent, and without any further ado, oh wait, is that? Please tell me I got that right. Yep. Good. It's okay. Only one slide. Yep. Um, go. I'm gonna do my very quick talk in German because it's about German public libraries, and I think um, it's not very interesting to talk about it in English because the project is currently completely in German. Um, es geht in dem Projekt, also ich lese gerne und um, ich lese noch ziemlich gerne auf Papier und noch nicht auf E-Books. Und weil ich mir nicht so viel Bücher leisten kann, wie ich gerne lese, benutze ich die Stadtbücherei. Und die Stadtbüchereien, die haben alle seit ziemlich vielen Jahren ziemlich coole Dinge. Da kann man nämlich mittlerweile online den Bestand durchsuchen und dann auch, das wisst ihr wahrscheinlich alle, und in den meisten Städten kann man auch nachgucken, was man denn eigentlich so für Medien ausgeliehen hat und vor allem, wann man die zurückgeben muss. 
Ähm, das Problem ist, wenn ich am Computer sitze, ist das selten der Fall, dass mich das interessiert. Die ähm, Situation, in denen mich das interessiert, ist, wenn ich in der Buchhandlung stehe und mich frage, ähm, kann, muss ich dieses Buch überhaupt kaufen oder kann ich das eigentlich auch in der Bücherei ausleihen? Wenn mir jemand hier ein Buch empfiehlt oder wenn ich abends im Bett liege und mir denke, Mist, muss ich dieses Buch eigentlich morgen zurückgeben? Und was ich dann habe, ist mein Smartphone. Und diese Software, die diese Büchereien da verwenden, die sind größtenteils älter als ich und das sind hässliche Frameworks, äh, Framesets, die ähm, auf einem Touchscreen nicht zu bedienen sind, wirklich nicht zu bedienen. Und ähm, deswegen habe ich mich irgendwann hingesetzt ähm, vor Wut und habe eine Android-App dafür angefangen, die diese, ähm, quasi diese Web-Software äh, Web bedient, Touchscreen-freundlich. Und warum ich da einen Lightning Talk drüber halte, diese, wie gesagt, es gibt unterschiedlichste Software dafür, die Bibliotheken, da gibt es ungefähr elf Hersteller in Deutschland, Österreich und der Schweiz und ähm, die sind alle gleich scheiße, diese Software, aber ähm, der Punkt ist jetzt eben, dass dieser Bereich, wo ich sehen kann, wo ich Bücher vorbestellen kann, wo ich sehen kann, wann muss ich meine Bücher angeben, der sieht überall anders raus und ich komme aus Mannheim und ich komme natürlich nur in den Mannheimer rein, weil ich nur in Mannheim eine Bücherei, einen Büchereiausweis habe. Das heißt, ich brauche für alle anderen Städte, selbst die, selbst die äh, Städte, die die gleiche Software verwenden, haben teilweise noch so kleine Unterschiede, dass ich das nicht programmieren kann. Das heißt, ich brauche aus jeder Stadt jemanden, der dieses Projekt cool findet und der mir fünf Minuten opfert und mir, ähm, mir eine E-Mail schreibt, aus welcher Stadt er kommt. Ihr könnt unter der Adresse nachgucken, welche Städte ich schon habe, welche ich noch brauche und ähm, der mir fünf Minuten opfert mir eine E-Mail schreibt, sagt aus welcher Stadt er kommt und ich schreibe euch, wie ihr mir ganz schnell helfen könnt. Das ist eine kleine Sache, in jeder Stadt ein bisschen unterschiedlich, deswegen kann ich es nicht einfach äh, so als Tutorial dahin schreiben. Aber es wäre super cool, wenn sich Leute melden. Ich bin auch noch den Rest des Kongresses hier und ihr könnt mich zu dem Projekt befragen oder direkt auf mich zukommen und mir eure Hilfe anbieten. Ist auch alles Open Source und auf GitHub, das heißt, wenn jemand mitprogrammieren möchte, freue ich mich auch. Um, all right, and as we are running a little bit short of time, if we get the next talk off, we will get back on the time. We are not taking any questions. There are still plenty of seats um, all across here. We're in the five minute lightning talk round. Uh, Georg, are you ready to go? Yes. Okay, excellent. Let's do this. Five minutes okay. starts now. Okay, so my name is Georg, and I would like to present you a nice trick with policy routing. Slide. So this trick we are going to discuss now is automatically routing HTTP requests for some specific websites through a VPN connection. So we are going to consider the following network layout. We have a nice little local area network with a Linux router. The Linux router manages the internet connection and the Linux router also has a VPN connection to a VPN server in the USA. Slide. So our goal is that if some client on the network starts an HTTP request for a website, the Linux router by itself decides which connection it should use. So should it use the standard internet connection or should it use the VPN connection to the USA that it are not presented with some sort of message like, okay, this video is not available in your country. And this should all be done without requiring any specific configuration on the client side. So you just connect your laptop to the network, you open your browser, type in the address of a thread something mystream.com and so, and the Linux router will automatically reroute the HTTP request through the VPN connection. And this all can be done pretty easily, as it turns out, so easily that I can explain it in hopefully a few minutes. So the basic idea is this, that we set up a transparent proxy server. The proxy server catches all the requests. It will tag the requests for the specific streaming sites. And we use this tagging information later on to route the request through the VPN connection. Slide. So the concrete implementation looks approximately like this. So for each streaming site, we add four configuration options to the proxy server configuration. In this case, this is squid, but it could probably also be done with another proxy server. So the first uh, access control list um, creates an access control list which will match all requests for um, a subdomain of mystream.com. The second access control list will match any descendant or child requests. So for example, um, if you get an HTML file from mystream.com and it will connect, uh, contain image tag for an image from some other domain.org, then it will have a referrer um, which contains the string mystream.com, so the second access control list will match. 
and the two configuration option at the bottom they essentially say okay if any of the two access controllers on the top match then use the IP address of the VPN connection as an outgoing address or so as a source address to get the data slide. So in this way we have now tagged all the requests in the sense that all data will be fetched using the IP of the VPN connection. Now we just have to take care of the routing because currently still the request would be routed with the default route so they will just use the default internet connection. We do this routing by creating a new routing table which in this case will be named USA VPN. This is the first command. Then we add a new routing rule which says okay every uh, packet which has an origin address of the VPN IP of the Linux router will be routed using will be routed using the routing table USA VPN. This is the second command, and the last command is that we add actually a route to this newly created routing table USA VPN. And this route essentially says, "Okay, forward everything to the VPN server, and it should take care of it." And that's everything that we have to do. So now, if a request gets in. One, for example, mystream.com, one of the AXS controllers will match, then the AX, um, corresponding outgoing address will be set, and it will be routed to the VPN server. And the VPN server will route the packet using its default route. So it will seem like you have used the VPN connection to access mystream.com. That's everything that you have to do, actually. Slide. One minute. Okay, there's an, another thing that you also can do with this technique is that you can combine two internet connections to create a better one. So, for example, if you have a satellite connection, an LTE connection, you want to split the HTTP request for small files and for large files, so that large files go to the satellite connection, which has unlimited traffic, and small files should go to the LTE connection, which has a limited amount of traffic, but also a shorter latency. So, essentially, instead of matching domain names, you are then going to match for file types, so that you get the HTML file a lot faster, then you can already read the page and the pictures will get um, later on. Will you, you will get the pictures later on because it's not so important that the pictures are loaded immediately. Yeah, and I think I won't spare the configuration options. That should be enough. Thanks. Okay. Did not want to get buzzed. I. Uh but I guess my timer can buzz me. Um, okay, good to go. Five minutes starts now, and uh, are we? Oh, uh, uh, crap. For one minute behind, it's my fault, as usual. Okay, uh, again, all information is available on the wiki for the lightning talks for today and tomorrow. Unfortunately, we are entirely booked, and we're running through what is going to be probably the longest session of lightning talks ever held at a Congress. We're going, we've been going since 12.45 without a break. Everybody has shown up, everybody's been on time, and I will try to, to make us not two minutes behind, so your five minutes starts now. Okay, hi. Um, so I'm not Anatol, I'm Sasha, Anatol couldn't come, so uh, I'm doing this talk. Next slide, please. Um, so probably some people here in this room use uh, SSH. And some people will probably use a key to, uh, or a, a public keys lo uh, logins to a lot of servers. And they probably manage a bunch of servers and have their public key all around across uh, servers, some of them. Uh, they might not even know about anymore because it's so long ago. Um, and uh, well, this is totally unmanaged in most situations. Uh, keys don't have an expiration date. Uh, so what will you do um, if uh, someone has your private key? You basically have to go through all servers where you have your public key on to revoke your key manually. Uh, this is quite shitty. <laughs> So, um, we thought we need a solution for that. Um, next slide, please. Ah, okay. So, um, so uh, next slide, please. I think I t told this already, so. Uh, okay. Um, 
So the OpenSSH project has some solutions for this, and they want to have it in uh, OpenSSH 8.0, but we don't think this is a solution already, because you will probably have other versions of SSH around for quite a long time on, uh, on uh, some of your servers, and you want something that's really uh, compatible with that too. Next slide, please. Um, we realized that um, there's a command option in authorized keys, so you can actually invoke a command from authorized keys to do stuff. Um, and that has been in uh, OpenSSH and in Drop Bear for quite a long time. So that's a, uh, this is something we can use. Next slide. Um, we also realized that OpenSSL can take in uh, SSH keys, so you can uh, actually sign content with your private key. Um, so, uh, next slide. Uh, that's uh, why, uh, uh, and with that tools we could uh, create Shark. And Shark is about the authorization and revocation of SSH keys. Uh, next slide. Um, Shark uh, at this point it comprises of two programs, uh, the Shark Gen uh, program, uh, that's basically a wrapper uh, uh, on OpenSSL and creates uh, nice uh, DNS records that you can put in DNS. Um, and that uh, you, you can look them up by fingerprint and then you can see whether or not the key that you're trying to use is uh, still valid and for how long it is valid uh, or that it has been revoked. So now we have a central place in which we can actually revoke the key. Um, next slide, please. And we have the Shark program that's actually used uh, in, uh, or is, is, uh, is, is used in the authorized key file uh, to actually do this checking, to actually connect to a DNS server and, uh, to, act, uh, and, and to get a response and act upon it. Um, and uh, it does this by, uh, you, you give it a fingerprint and it actually uses the command uh, uh, in which you just provide a valid, um, a, a valid uh, email address um, and from that it derives your, uh, uh, it, it derives your uh, domain in which the DNS de uh, resides. You could also use an option to directly uh, directly state on which server the, 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 the Shark program has to look up the DNS record. Next slide, please. So this is how the... One minute. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is how it's more or less uh, used. Um, you generate this key um, and you put it in the DNS. Next slide. Um, and uh, so you invoke it and use it. So next slide. Uh, and this is the output. You don't get the fancy colors, but uh, well, the idea is quite uh, simple. We also give output if you're logging in uh, that states when uh, your key will be expiring, because otherwise you will uh, seconds. Lock, probably lock yourself out because you don't remember that your key ha uh, is about to expire. Okay, next slide. Um, we want to extend this. It uh, currently runs with uh, RSA only, um, so we want to extend it to DSA and, of course, electro, uh, elect, elliptical curve DSA. Okay, next slide. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Sebastian, as you cannot see on this slide. Uh, I want to introduce you to a, a concept which was originally born last year on uh, the, con well, the unconference on Leica. Uh, they experimented with personal hosting, letting normal people host physical files, actually, but giving people a, file, a sense of hosting. And this is where this comes from. These days you've got, as you can see here, loads of wireless devices, and then uh, one of them is actually not a wireless device, as you can see, the Raspberry Pi. Um, and these wireless devices, mainly the top one, uh, the 
well, the blue one, the TP-Link ones, they're the most interesting in my eyes because you get full root, you get Linux on them, and they don't use any power and come with batteries. Um, so the idea of the concept is to get uh, an access point running Linux and storage, which you can carry, carry in your bag. And when you carry it in your bag, it will search other nodes, and it will look for nodes, and when it finds a node, it will talk to it and say, Hi, what do you have on data? And so, oh, I'm interested in data, and it'll share. And when it has downloaded the data, you, at the end of the day, you can look like you're looking at Facebook. You can look what it has downloaded, and it can find status messages, or it can find files, music, whatever you describe to be interested of. And basically, the idea, the concept being described here then is uh, taking, offline, taking the internet offline. You've got Offline mesh communication, low latency, uh, so, yeah, low latency, um, completely hosted by the owner of the files without intermediate infrastructure owned by telecom organizations or uh, very smart hackers who people don't know. Uh, so that's basically the concept of this talk. So hopefully you, you can think about it, think what you want about it, but this is the concept. If you have any questions, I think I have time. Okay, you have, you have two minutes, 55 seconds on the clock, but we'll do one minute of questions since you finished in two minutes. One minute. And please repeat the speaker's score. Please repeat the question. Okay. Any questions? No questions. All right. Short talk. Where can they find you later? Uh, they can find me online either at Sebastian Wetmind or number 6664. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much. Ciao. And so the time is now 14.20, and hope maybe we will actually get back on time from up to a five-minute deficit. Um, Hog, ready to go? Yeah. Five minutes starts now. Okay. Um, der Talk ist auf Deutsch. Ich möchte euch Freies Magazin vorstellen. Next slide. Um, Freies Magazin ist ein monatlich erscheinendes Online-Magazin über alle Themen related uh, zu freier Software, Open Source, Linux, sehr breit. Das Format der Artikel reicht von sehr klein, einseitig, monatlicher Kernrückblick oder eine Rezension von dem Buch über mehrseitig oder sogar, was weiß ich, ein Perl-Tutorium, das über mehrere Monate sich erstreckt. Die Lizenz des Magazins ist so frei, wie es nur sein kann. Die Ausgabe, ihr kriegt das Magazin entweder als HTML, EPUB oder PDF. Ich mag es sehr, weil es sehr angenehm zu lesen ist. Ich habe am Ende ein Beispiel, wie es aussieht. Next slide. Hier kurz als Wortwolke die Themen des letzten Jahres oder dieses Jahres. Ich bin der Meinung, da ist für jeden etwas dabei. Also schaut es euch mal an. Next slide. Wo findet ihr das Ganze? Website www.freiesmagazin.de. Wenn ihr Fragen habt, es gibt ein Kontaktformular, es gibt eine E-Mail-Adresse, ähm, Feedback ist immer gern gesehen. Ähm, es gibt auch eine Leserbriefsektion wie, wie in einem guten Magazin. Intern benutzen wir zur Dokument äh, zur, ähm, Kommunikation DokuWiki, ähm, wo wir uns absprechen, wer macht was, äh, welcher Abschnitt, welcher Artikel. Äh, wir planen und, und tauschen uns aus. Ähm, wir benutzen ein Subversion Repository für äh, alle Artikel ähm, zu revisionieren, aber auch um dort Richtlinien für die Setzer Layouter ähm, abzulegen. Die gesamte Verwaltung ist da drin, Skripte, die benutzt werden, um die ähm, Artikel eben zu setzen. Ähm, wenn ich sage wir, ähm, das Projekt, ich bin nur ein sehr kleine, kleines Rad in der Park. Ähm, wir haben etwa ein bisschen mehr als ein Dutzend, äh, vielleicht 20 Mitarbeiter, äh, noch mal so viele freie Autoren. Ähm, das bringt mich auch zur nächsten Slide. Next Slide. Ähm, ich möchte euch anregen, mitzumachen. Freies Magazin ist eine sehr schöne Möglichkeit, auch für Nichtprogrammierer etwas an die Community zurückzugeben. Ja? Man kann als, entweder als freier Autor oder als Übersetzer ähm, Artikel eben einreichen. Wenn man ein tolles Programm benutzt, Open Software benutzt, findet das toll, schreibt man einfach einen Artikel darüber und veröffentlicht ihn. Die Redaktion, ähm, es gibt 
Autorenrichtlinien und ähm, die Redaktion hilft einem, wie das funktioniert. Ähm, oder man arbeitet als äh, Setzer, Layouter als, äh, oder in der Redaktion mit. Möglichkeiten gibt es viele. Ähm, geht auf die Seite freiesmagazin.de mitmachen oder schreibt eine E-Mail, kontaktiert mich, ich bin noch äh, bis morgen hier. Next slide. Äh, Wenn es Fragen gibt, wie gesagt, an mich. Next slide. Can you scroll through, Nick? So, yeah, just slowly go through. Das ist eine, äh, die PDF-Ausgabe, just go on. Ähm, und einfach nur als Beispiel, das ist die, die äh, letzte Ausgabe des Jahres, ähm, wie das aussieht. Ihr seht äh, ein sehr ansprechendes Design. Äh, wir legen Wert darauf, dass das auch konsistent durchge äh, durchgezogen wird. Ähm, nette Screenshots, nette Bilder. Äh, es gibt immer auch eine Linkliste am Ende des Artikels. Es gibt im Ende des Jahres ähm, eine Liste von allen Artikeln, die im Jahr erschienen sind. Das heißt, wenn ihr euch jetzt nicht sicher seid, ob äh, Themen dabei sind, die euch interessieren, ladet euch die aktuelle Ausgabe runter. Ganz am Ende ist, wie gesagt, ein Index aller Artikel dieses Jahres. Vielen Dank. Fragen? Good. And with that extra 45 seconds, I'm going to accept a cookie delivery. Huge round of applause for cookies, which are mine, not yours. Don't ever again steal cookies from this nice Mr. Nick Farr. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the cookie delivery. Huge round of applause for having the courage to get up on stage <laughs> and bring me something which I hope will sustain me for the next, we have next, oh, next probably half hour, 45 minutes, but without any further ado, you ready? Yes. Five minutes starts now. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Sofa Kissen and I wanted the project Hardware for all vorstellen. Das entstand vor ein, zwei Monaten ähm, aus der Idee, dass irgendwie jeder einen Computer haben sollte, aber öfters kommt das ja mal vor, man liest das vielleicht auf Twitter, dass ein Rechner von jemandem kaputt geht und er sich nicht sofort einen neuen leisten kann. Da gab es dann zum Beispiel diese Spendenaktion für, für Stefan Urbach, ähm, da, wo, wo ihm ein neuer Rechner gespendet wurde. Da gab es Anfang des Jahres schon mal eine für einen anderen Twitterer und da kam mir so die Idee, wie kann man das irgendwie for the rest of us äh, machen für Menschen, die nicht irgendwie so ein bisschen bekannt sind, die, die so großen Support irgendwie mobilisieren können. Da kam irgendwie auch die Idee, ähm, die, keiner hat ja sein erstes Smartphone oder sein erstes Notebook irgendwie rumstehen und diese alten Geräte sind ja nicht schlechter dadurch, dass sie einfach nicht mehr benutzt werden, weil man das Nachfolgemodell hat. Und ähm, diese Geräte könnte man ja einfach jemandem geben, der sich keins leisten kann, wenn man sie selbst nicht mehr benutzt. Und da wollten wir eine, eine, eine Plattform bauen, wo man sehr leicht diese Menschen irgendwie zusammenbringen kann. Wenn jemand hat ein Gerät über ein Smartphone oder ein Notebook oder einen anderen funktionierenden Computer, kann er einfach jemandem den äh, schenken, tatsächlich. Und da äh, haben wir diese, diese Plattform gebaut, die gibt es jetzt seit heute auch unter hardware-für-alle.de. Man kann auch einfach bei Google Hardware für alle eingeben, dann findet man das. Ähm, das ist so ein bisschen unsere Public Beta jetzt. Da kann man sich einfach einloggen über seinen Twitter, Facebook, Google oder GitHub Account, kann ein Gerät eintragen über ein Formular ganz einfach und dann kann jemand, der einen, ähm, gerade wirklich irgendwie dringenden Bedarf an einem Gerät hat, sich keins leisten kann aus, aus äh, seiner Situation heraus, ähm, denjenigen anschreiben und ähm, ja, dann, dann können die den, den, dieses Verschenken der Hardware quasi unter, unter sich ähm, organisieren. Ähm, die, die Idee dahinter ist halt so ein sehr idealistischer Solidaritätsgedanke äh, und auch ähm, der Gedanke, dass irgendwie Internet eine Grundversorgung äh, sein sollte. Und ähm, der Zugang zum Internet ist halt nicht nur der Internetanschluss, sondern auch das, das Gerät, mit dem man irgendwie äh, den Zugang zum Internet wirklich dann, dann hat. Und das ist halt äh, ein Kostenfaktor, der oft irgendwie nicht, nicht bedacht wird. Und nicht jeder kann sich halt einen, einen Computer immer leisten äh, in der Situation, wo er einen braucht, wenn dann halt der, der bestehende Computer äh, kaputt geht. Und ähm, ja, äh, ich würde euch jetzt einfach mal äh, aufrufen, auch diese Seite dann quasi zu testen, die jetzt äh, online ist, wenn ihr irgendwie ähm, 
ich weiß nicht, vielleicht haben viele auch einfach ein, noch ein altes äh, Notebook irgendwie zu Hause rumstehen, das sie nicht mehr brauchen und dass sie, ähm, ja, verschenken ist halt im Zweifelsfall immer besser als wegwerfen oder, oder verrotten lassen von so, so alten Geräten, äh, die ja immer noch gut sind. Ähm, also geht einfach auf die Seite irgendwie, loggt euch mal ein, schaut euch das an, äh, testet das ein bisschen, wenn's, äh, wenn ihr irgendwelche Fragen habt noch dazu oder irgendwie euch irgendwas auffällt oder, oder sonst was. Könnt ihr mich auch ansprechen oder, oder den, ähm, den Virus, der das äh, programmiert hat. Wir sind äh, in der zweiten Etage gegenüber vom Bällebad, könnt ihr uns äh, ansprechen. Ähm, ja, das war's soweit. Mm, cookies. I love cookies, thank you for that. And thank you for that awesome quick presentation. Not a word of it I understood. Um, all right, we are going to take a very, very slight break. Um, we're actually on time. And someone for the first time in the Lightning Talks actually submitted a video, which is something you can actually do. So we're going to go ahead and uh, I think we're going to advance this a little bit to only play four minutes of it to allow for one minute of talk. Is that good? Is okay? Okay, great. So that's what we're going to do. Oh, if you wanted to talk over it, we can mute it for you. Would you okay, prefer that? Yeah, let's mute. Uh, um, okay, that's okay. that's easy, easy peasy. Okay, sorry. No problem. Go for it. Okay, uh, I want to talk about Positive Hack Days. It's Russian Security Conference. Uh, we have second edition uh, last year. Uh, our conference um, was born because you know there are many, uh, very unusual a situation with uh, Russian security community. From one side, there are no Russian security community. From second side, there are a lot of dirty hackers from Russia. So we try to combine, uh, to change this mind, to create Russian security community, to invite different people all around the world uh, uh, to demonstrate, talent, uh, to help talented people to um, proof way skill and we start to organize positive hack days now positive hack days is two days in international uh, hacking forum with uh, six tracks of conference with ctf unfortunately ctf calls already finished it but uh, i think uh, you can participate in online hack quest during positive hack days and our new uh, challenges, uh, different challenges, for example, air drone hacking contest, uh, ATM workshop, uh, and snatch online banking uh, competition. Uh, we will uh, be held the snatch online hacking uh, online banking hacking competition uh, in uh, hall 30 uh, since uh, uh, 3 p.m. So join us. And our idea is to combine different kind of people, business community, uh, hacking community, and security guys, security experts from different uh, vendors on one uh, place and to make them interact with each other. To uh, When young guys uh, hacking uh, online bank or ATM machine and uh, uh, somebody from bank uh, come to them and ask it, oh, how, how you did it. So it's very um, useful from our point of view and this is our approach. Different people uh, from different industries, from different ideas in uh, one uh, place with uh, uh, in way can communicate and of course we have open bar if any interest in it uh, uh, we saw a star is is a, a russian style ctf to drunk to hack challenge so if ips uh, yeah detect you you will um, you must take a shot uh, and uh, uh, this uh, uh, winners of to run to hack. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, 
I think uh, PhD 2012 uh, was off awesome, and uh, we uh, will do our best to make it uh, better in uh, 2000. Uh, uh, in next year, uh, Peach Day is free, uh, and I hope uh, you will join us uh, if you have something to submit, workshop, uh, papers, or uh, hands-on lab, we are waiting for you, and uh, I hope you, if you don't want to submit, you can just visit Moscow and join uh, our forum and have a lot of fun and get a lot of uh, knowledge. So that's also rock and roll. That's <laughs> Thank you. All right, most excellent. Thank you, um, Sergey from the Positive Hack Days crew. Oliver, are you ready to go? Yep. And oh my Good goodness, test. we are okay. actually, believe it or not, we're actually two minutes ahead of schedule. So don't fail. Go. OK. In contrast with our intellect, computers double the performance every 18 months. So the danger is real that they could develop intelligence and eventually take over the world. This sounds like taken from the next best fantasy sci-fi novel, but it's not. It's taken from a quite famous person around here, and I guess a few people at least know his name. Next slide, please. Stephen Hawking. Um, this is the topic I want to talk about. Next slide, please. It's the technological, technological singularity, as it, as it is called. And each company and, and institute that has something to do with that is the Singularity Institute. And it does a little bit of research in the topic of friendly and unfriendly artificial intelligence. And I, before I want to talk about that, I want to talk a bit about, about myself. Next slide, please. I am a student of mathematics at Stuttgart University. I'm teaching a high school course for decision theory and by using reasoning. And I'm working together at this moment with the Singularity Institute to create a safe AI science. And why we need a safe AI science, I will develop in the next few slides. Next slide, please. So, the biggest problem with AI security and so on is the problem that normally AI, at least if we build in self optimizing an AI, it normally ends in a feedback loop. That means normally if we are able to develop an AI with at least roughly near or anything at all human intelligence, then it should be able to optimize its codes further because it had far more easy access to its own source code. This optimized AI, because it is more intelligent, we needed intelligence to build an AI, should be able to build or optimize itself to an even better AI. This should obviously lead to an intelligence feedback loop and lead to skyrocketing in the intelligence of the AI. But there's one little problem. Next slide, please. Everyone is agreed that this kind of feedback loop can exist, that this happens, that in the artificial intelligence science this is well known. But there's one strange thing. If you do this further and develop this anything beyond the human intelligence level, then normally an uh, angry mob turns out of nowhere, stones you to death, or something like that. Because at this moment, the artificial intelligence community does not want to think or does not want to talk about anything that is higher than human intelligence. And that is a huge problem, because obviously this feedback loop has no reason to stop at human level intelligence. And obviously there are implications that we have to think about from higher than human level intelligence. And next slide, please. That is kind of the reason why we should do that. Elisa Yudkowsky, a research fellow of mine, said this is quite fittingly. The AI does not hate you, nor does it love you, but you are made out of atoms it can use for something else. <laughs> Let <laughs> Normally, you give an AI a task, a thing it has to optimize, a thing it has to do, and there's no reason why it should care at all for human life, the things we value, the things we love and do about. And AI and safe AI science is a thing we have to talk about, but we are not doing it this at all at the moment in the artificial intelligence community. So next slide, please. The Singularity Institute is an institute that tries to fix it, that tries to make research, talk with the community, talk with paper, uh, talk with uh, newspaper, talk with overall the media, and tries to get more awareness to this whole topic. And it needs your help. It needs money, it needs contributions, it needs people who can help. 
and we really need more hackers, especially because at this moment we are lacking in. We need we need more mathematicians. We need more um, programmers to do this whole from a more basic science level to do this really to really put something forward that is on a mathematical level correct and leads to some attention on this level. So next slide, please. Thanks for the time. Um, if you want to contact me or the Singular Institute, these are web pages. And if you're interested in helping, talking to me, or just straighting off into some philosoph philosophical discussion about this whole topic, I'm here. I will be here till the end of the um, Congress. And otherwise, write me a mail, visit the Singularity webpage, or talk to me after the Lightning Talks. Thanks. All right, this is amazing. I think we have a, uh, a presently unblemished record. Everybody has shown up for the past two hours and shown up exactly on time. That's, I think we can take 10 seconds to, <laughs> to celebrate that. And also, I do have to apologize. I did not have time to correct that one statistic. So you can no, take- No, it's fine, don't worry. It's Okay, Thanks. all right, <laughs> I apologize. So, so now something completely different. Uh, Women on Waves is a non-profit organization from the Netherlands that creates access to safe and legal abortion using different strategies. Next slide, please. Um, it's one of the most performed medical procedures in the world, and about uh, 48,000 women die because it's illegal in some countries. Next slide, please. This is the world map. Um, the red and the pink uh, countries are the countries where it's illegal, and the green countries is where it's legal. So there's a north south difference. In Europe, it's still Poland, Ireland, and Malta. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to give you a short medical course. Um, uh, but I'm not going into details. These are medicines that are registered by the World Health Organization as essential medicines. Basically, medical abortion has changed the reality for women. It has made do-it-yourself abortions possible. Uh, women don't need a doctor. It's the same as a miscarriage. It's very safe. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, that, so, um, we are um, working uh, to guarantee access to medical abortion because this is something women can do themselves. Can I next, next, next one? Um, next one. Um, so it gives women the possibility to take their own lives in their own hands again. Can I have the next one? Next one. Um, so the, st uh, the strategies that we use, uh, we have a ship that goes to countries where abortion is illegal. Um, we uh, support local groups to open hotlines and we have an internet site called Women on Web where women can do an online consultation and they get the pill sent to their home address. Can I have the next slide? So this was a campaign in Portugal where we sent a ship and uh, the Minister of Defense decided that we were a threat to national security and stopped the ship with warships. Um, next slide. Fortunately, this led to the fall of the government um, and um, <laughs> abortion. <laughs> Abortion is now legal in Portugal. Um, can I have the next slide? We also won the European Court of Human Rights case that they violated our expression to freedom, uh, freedom of expression. Next slide. Um, so we learned from this during our last campaign in Morocco, uh, where the ship was already laying in the harbor, and even though it was prepared through a secret Facebook group, which is not very uh, safe, um, the security officers did not know the ship was already in the harbor, and some people really got shit for that. Next slide, please. So uh, the safe abortion hotlines, these are now everywhere in South America. Um, next one. Uh, this was the launch of the one in Ecuador, which this is the Virgin of Quito. Next one. The way this one is in Chile. Next one. The way it's being uh, distributed, the information is by stamping money. Next one. Um, hacking commercial boards. Next one. Um, and of course, the media is very important. This never happened, by the way. Not, we didn't have opposition. Next one. Um, so Women on Web is a very important tool. We started in 2006. Next one. Next one. Um, and women can go online and do an online consultation and get the pill sent to their home address. Currently, more than 6,000 women are being helped, and more than 100,000 emails per year in 11 different languages are answered by our um, help desk group. Next one, please. Of course, we have problems that the website is sometimes censored. Next one. Um, we also have other censorship problems with Google, uh, Facebook. Next one. Um, this were the Google ads uh, where we learned that they were not allowed anymore. Next one. Facebook took away my, uh, my profile.
horrible picture. Next one. Uh, but they apologized, fortunately, because there were no naked breasts. Next one. So the other technique that we're using is augmented reality. This is a, a virtual banner hanging in front of the Vatican that says abortion pills are a gift from God. Next one. That's what, thank you. Okay, not only was that presentation amazing, but nobody has gone through a deck that big <laughs> that quickly in the history of lightning talks. And so in addition to all that, right, huge round of applause just for that. That was epic. <laughs> and now we're not insanely ahead of time, still two minutes ahead of schedule, and all of the wonderful speakers just keep showing up. It's, it's absolutely amazing. Are you ready to go? Yes. Okay, your five minutes starts now. Okay. Uh, I want to quickly introduce the concept of data mining with uh, malware, applying it to malware, specifically with a real-world example of applying this to PDF-based malware, uh, and then hopefully taking this a bit further, having you guys take this a bit further, to help go combat other file formats and, and apply this in other ways. Next slide. So the present problems that we currently have with malware, at least in the states, is that analysis of every single file does not scale. We get hundreds of thousands of files a day, all malicious or sometimes unclassified, and we're kind of confused with what to do with them. So we're wasting cycles processing every file. Uh, it ends up being a waste of time for all of our analysts, and we could be doing something else in the meantime. Uh, also, binning malware by uh, analysts is also often error prone. Um, somebody may classify something different than another company, and thus they may duplicate efforts and, again, waste time. Next slide. So I wanted to introduce the concept of data mining, um, more or less extracting data from large data sets and then using that to build uh, some sort of machine learning, uh, using machine learning algorithms to then classify files, whether or not they were malicious. So to do this, you have to take a PDF file format or the file format that you're performing this on and reduce it down to a simplistic vector. So this flat vector needs to be able to represent what a PDF is without actually being the PDF. So essentially what we're we're doing is we're teaching the computer what a good, bad, and targeted PDF looks like through this vector. So we represent what is a PDF in this very simplified format. So with this, we swap out features and algorithms until we get the desired results, which is we want to essentially classify unknown files and say this is malicious, this one's targeted, and this one's non-malicious. Next slide. So for this, uh, for this little experiment, uh, the, these numbers are a little off, but the data set was uh, 6,000 non-malicious PDFs, uh, about, I think it was 15,000 malicious PDFs, and then a couple hundred targeted PDFs. Next slide. Uh, to actually begin this process in the data mining kind of cycle, you need to actually pick features. And features essentially are that, that part that make a PDF what a PDF is. So these are picked off of subject matter expertise. Um, we use things like name dictionaries uh, that was used in exploitation, things like JavaScript and whatnot. And then uh, characteristics describing the file, how many objects were present, how large was the file, was it malformed in any way, did it follow the specification. Uh, and then we added and removed these features until we got the desired result of what it is that we wanted. Uh, in total, it was 35 features, and they looked like this. Next slide. Uh, in a tabular format, you essentially represent this data. Uh, each line is a, uh, a PDF, essentially, and it's more or less a vector of information. And those numbers, while they look like something out of the matrix or you know, nonsensical, uh, they actually describe uh, a good, bad, and targeted PDF. Next slide. So from this, with that information, uh, I used uh, open source libraries called Orange in uh, Python, and we used known classification algorithms, Bayesian, uh, k-nearest neighbor, SVM, and decision tree. To the right of each one of those algorithms is the actual, uh, I would call it preliminary results of doing testing uh, with the classifier. So essentially, I, I feed all the PDFs through that, and I say, you know, what is the accuracy of this? Did it properly find the malicious ones? Did it properly classify the non-malicious? And did it properly classify the targeted? So um, this was done through uh, a ten-folds cross-validation method, which is a data mining technique to basically use your testing data as a way of validating your classifiers. And as you can see there, the results are pretty good. Next slide. 
So this is, uh, it actually got tooled up um, in something I call a classy PDF, where essentially you can take uh, a Python script and point it One at a directory, and what it'll do is it'll give you this output, and you'll see it's pretty uh, self-explanatory that it'll tell you whether or not the file is targeted, malicious or non-malicious, and then it'll give you a percentage of what the actual classifier uh, deemed that as. Next slide. Uh, the practical use, this is implemented within the PDF X-Ray tool set, uh, reduces the time spent looking at all of these files. Instead, you can run this tool against it and then find out whether or not something's malicious and if you want to look at it further. Uh, it helps identify potential targeted seconds. attacks and it provides a percentage on classification to assist the user. Next slide. Uh, it's been added to the PDF X-Ray API. Next slide. And in summary, data mining is good. The time investment is well worth the effort up front. Um, it requires minimal tuning, and then you can apply general concepts and ideas to other problems in file formats. Good. Next slide. And then just a quick reminder, as long as the presenters give permission, um, all of these slides are going to be available on the wiki after the Congress is over. Um, we are now, oh, 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 Katie, thank you so much. I, oh, oh, God, I really, really needed this mate. Oh. And surprisingly, we are, we are two minutes ahead of schedule. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You are absolutely amazing. I, I think I can still, I think I can still do this. We good? This is amazing. If the next three presenters show up, it will be a perfect round. That's An really absolutely nice. perfect round. R round of applause for that real quick since we have the time. And go. Shoy uh, Rodo, I'm here to talk about Lojban. I'm Timo. And I'll start with what is Lojban? Next slide, please. Lojban is a conlang, which stands for constructed language. It's not a programming language like you're used to, maybe. So it's used for speaking, people speaking to people, or speak, uh, people speaking to a computer, or a computer speaking to people. Uh, next slide, please. And what is the purpose of this? Um, I'm just going to tell you the, a few of the design uh, goals for Lojban. Uh, next slide, please. The first one is removing as much ambiguity from language as possible. And of course, uh, removing semantic uh, ambiguity is impossible, so we only do uh, grammar and syntax unambiguously. Uh, next slide, please. And this turns it into an awesome nerd toy because we love stuff that's uh, completely unambiguous, like programming language just can be parsed. Next slide, please. And Logiban has a uh, context-free grammar, which is really awesome because it can easily be parsed by uh, a computer and you get a parse tree and it's really nice. And uh, on top of that, the grammar is really simple to learn. There are um, no conjugations, declinations, no word ever flexes, and it's really, really cool. Next slide, please. And another design goal is to create a language that is as culturally neutral as possible. So we don't have silly things like uh, words that have genders, like uh, in German, uh, the word Mädchen, uh, girl, is female, uh, is, is um, neutral and such things. That's not in Lojban. And uh, next slide, please. To create the vocabulary, we've devised an algorithm to use six most spoken source languages at the time to create words, which are Mandarin, English, Hindi, Arabic, Russian, and Spanish. Next slide, please. And this leads to a few, well, really a couple of easily uh, recognizable words like birge for beer, karche for car, liste for list, dansu for dance, mucche for much, and I guess you can uh, guess what fofa is supposed to mean. Next slide, please. And it's called the logical languages. Uh, what does that even mean? Next slide, please. It means it's based on predicate logic. And one such predicate is nenri, which is the concept of something being inside something else. And let's construct a little example sentence from that. Next slide, please. What is a thing that usually has things in it? Well, a box, obviously. Lotanche. Next slide, please. And what do you usually find in such a box? Well, since this is the internet, of course, the answer is a cat. Lomlatu. Next slide, please. And these concepts very simply combine into a full sentence. Lomlatu ku nenri lotanche, which is just the cat is in the box. Next slide, please. And 
Even though it's the logical language, it is very different from uh, Vulkan, which is completely emotionless, because Logibahn has a complete system for expressing your attitude and your emotions toward uh, different parts of the sentence. So in this case, I've added three uh, little parts. You is for love, like I love you. So in this case, I express my love for the cat. Zaha is an epistemological modifier which says, I know this from personal observation. So um, I know the cat is inside the box because I saw it maybe jump in or look out. And where shuhi means I'm not surprised about it being a box. Uh, next slide, please. And of course, since we have a context-free grammar, this is the parse tree. It's uh, colorful and simple and small. Uh, sentences can get very complicated, nested, and with lots of extra stuff, so it becomes bigger, but the computer can still understand and parse it really, really fast. Next slide, please. One minute. Okay, so how do you learn Lojban? Next slide, please. We uh, have lessons on the RSC, Irshi, and our Mumble voice server. There's a document called the Wave Lessons, which is just because we made it on Google Wave, which is pretty new and pretty awesome, and there's Lojban for beginners. Next slide, please. Uh, you can learn words, words using pre-made decks from Anki or Memrise. You can find them on the internet. They're awesome. Anki is for uh, Windows, Mac, Linux, Android, and iOS, and Memrise is just a website. Next slide, please. And when you have learned Lojban, you can talk to people, or you could read one of those translations. Seconds. Next slide, please. We have a complete translation of Alice in Wonderland, The Little Prince, and Kant's Metamorphosis. Next slide, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You can find me on Twitter at lolTimo, call me on deck 2303, or find me in front of the lecture hall or in the Entropy Assembly. Thank you very much. If you'll allow me just to thank God for Mate. I don't think I'd be able to survive without it. Um, other than that, Chad, are you ready to go? Uh, yeah, I am. Okay, we're still one surprisingly one minute ahead of schedule, and even though we are, uh, I'm going to take this minute to say, even though this session is supposed to end at 1500, um, because we had lots of good submissions, we're actually going to go to 1510, if that's okay. So yes, that will be two and a half hours of lightning talk, something that I'm not sure has ever been done before. But Chad, we're back on schedule. Five minutes are yours, starting now. Cool. Hi, I'm Chad. Uh, I'm from HeatSync Labs in Arizona. And um, uh, I kind of have some uh, obscure musical interests. Um, I've, I don't think uh, musical harmony is mathematically rigorous enough. And uh, as a consequence, I think uh, modern musical tuning on like pianos and guitars is uh, kind of garbage. So I have this weird problem where I want to go out in the world and I want to make music, but the, music, the, the instruments I want to use don't exist, so I have to make them myself. So I wanted to make um, this uh, organ. Uh, it, this, it's going to be a bunch of keys. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the design features, uh, I'll go in reverse order. Um, I, I want to do 28 tones, which I decided, um, for reasons I want to elaborate it, on 28 tones per octave uh, that will be arranged in a grid, kind of like a, uh, yeah, two dimensions, not like a, a line of keys on like a piano. Uh, I, want, I figured three octaves would be enough. I wanted a sine wave output, so you press, you press the, the key and a corresponding sine wave tone comes out. Um, and I wanted the keys to be volume sensitive, so maybe I could be a little bit louder if I hit it harder or something like that. Next slide, please. Uh, the key was the first thing I had to design. Um, it, these are um, structures that the, the key, that will hold the parts, the electrical and mechanical parts. Uh, one problem I ran into right away was that uh, with an acoustic piano, you're kind of confined to a few centimeters wide, but you can put all the parts in as deep as you want. But when I'm doing a grid, I, can, I only have a few cubic um, centimeters to work with. So all the parts have to fit within this little kind of structure and has to be structurally sound. Another thing is they fit in next to each other uh, to make the grid. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I figured I, this is kind of experimental. Uh, the deeper you press it, the louder I wanted the output to get. So um, you, push it, you push it down. Um, there's some electronic and mechanical parts which will increase the volume. Next slide, please. Uh, the way I, I, my design was that um, there's, a sh there's a shaft underneath the button, and when you push it, it goes down. Uh, there would be a hole in it, but on one side of the hole would be an LED, but as, as the hole um, 
goes down, the more light goes through, and I have a photoresistor which detects that change, and that, that resistance corresponds to a volume output. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is just some pictures. You can see that, the, the button on top, the, the shaft, um, all the parts, all the holes for the LED to fit into, wires. Uh, next slide, please. Here's another picture of them all fitting together. You can see the top part. They all fit together. They all have corresponding nooks and teeth that fit in. Next slide, please. Uh, then I had to make the oscillator. And it, it, this is just kind of like needlessly painstaking the way I did it. I wanted to make 82 oscillators, which is kind of atypical. A lot of like really old like MOOCs since they just have one oscillator. Uh, but the advantage with 82 is I could play as many at notes at the same time as I want. Um, another thing is a stable analog and sign is almost like a contradiction right away. Uh, I made, I found some designs on the internet and I'd make the, the sine wave oscillator and just be noise and constant, like constantly changing, not stable at all. Uh, but I cooperated with a guy uh, who, who works next door to our hackerspace named Dean. Dean is a genius and we, we came up with this oscillator that is just remarkably stable. Like I don't even understand how, why it's so stable. Uh, we took a heat gun to it and just shot it at point blank and it didn't seem to change. I, uh, I tuned each one by hand uh, and they, they, they didn't change after that. They didn't drift or anything. Next slide, please. Oh yeah, so here's, here's um, how I organized it. I figured rather than just one board with 82 oscillators, I would just put them on smaller boards. Uh, these pots can change the tone and the volume and they kind of tune it, adjust it, make it really, really clear and kind of a nice sound as opposed to distortion. Uh, next slide, please. So this is how I, I decided to actually organize the, the instrument is I, I'd make modules of uh, two by six keys. I think, yeah, two by six, um, and I would just stack them next to each other. And the fact that they're all flat, they could just be bundled together. And on top, you have uh, kind of like a, uh, two dimensions of keys. Uh, so as you can see, the buttons are on top. Under, underneath that is the switches. Underneath that is the actual oscillators. And there's enough holes for wires to come in and out for power and the actual audio signal. Um, uh, Next slide, please. Yeah, here's just all the pieces fitting together. Everything just fits together really nice. It's really pleasant when that works out. Uh, a mix of acrylic and wood. Uh, next slide, please. And here's just some rough buttons I, I made um, for just this mock-up. Um, I'm not finished yet, but I have all the things together and they work, and that's kind of exciting. Uh, I spent about three months this summer just working on it nonstop, and then school started, so I kind of took a break. But I, I want to get back on this. Uh, and I, I hope I can do that next, uh, this, this upcoming summer. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so if you want to talk to me about this, um, you can email me or you just find me talk, uh, some other time. Um, I'll be wandering around. So uh, thank you. Oh, please don't fail now. Not now. Whew. Okay. Awesome. This is the second to last talk. We've got two more, and your five minutes starts now. Hi, my name is Hubert. Um, I work as a pen tester for a bank, and I'm a bit of an Apple fanboy. And um, my talk is about a tool I wrote called iSniff GPS. Uh, slide, please. So in March this year, there was an interesting article on Ars Technica talking about uh, an info leak issue affecting all iPhones. So it turns out when you connect an iPhone or an iPad to a Wi-Fi network, um, the device will sometimes send out ARP requests, which disclose the MAC address of Wi-Fi routers that you've joined previously. Slide, please. So the article talked about how this is a big privacy issue and how you could, you know, by passive sniffing, you could find out where somebody lives. So I set out to write a little proof of concept tool that actually captures this information. And you know, I wanted to look into whether, whether you could actually do that. So the tool consists of two parts. There's a Python script, which uses Scapy to either sniff a, a live uh, interface or read from a PCAP file. So I capture the client MAC addresses. Uh, I capture the ARP requests, which contain the information disclosure. Um, I capture Bonjour broadcasts, which disclose the, you know, your Hubert's iPhone or whatever the, the name you set on your device. And I also capture standard 802.11 probe requests, so the requests that every Wi-Fi device sends out for previously joined networks. Slide, please. So this is just the, the output of running the Python script. You can see it's um, just gathering SSID probes, Bonjour broadcasts, and ARPs. Slide, please. 
So this is the Django web interface, which allows you to browse the information that the import script has collected. So I ran this for maybe um, half an hour at Black Hat in Vegas a couple of months ago, and I, uh, there was a lot of traffic there. So I captured information about over 1,000 devices probing for 3,500 networks. Uh, slide, please. So you can you look at the information you collect uh, grouped by network. So you can see there's about 600 devices that probe for the SSID Black Hat. You can look at get a list of specific clients that probe for one network. Slide, please. Now, clicking on a particular client that you've passively seen probing for networks, um, you can see this particular f uh, device, I think is an iPad, belonging to a friend of mine. Um, it's probed for these SSIDs, and I've captured these two apps from it. Um, so, slide, please. So just given an SSID probe, which you know every laptop and every Wi-Fi device sends out SSIDs of networks you've previously joined. So just given those names, um, depending on the name, you can sometimes locate them quite precisely. So, I mean, in the case of Black Hat, you know, there's a there's a public website called Weigel.net, which is like a public open repository of, of war driving data. Anybody can submit to it. So if you have a unique SSID, you know, something not Netgear, you know, something more unique than that, you can sometimes get a get get a location just from the SSID names. Uh, slide, please. So more interestingly, if you capture one of these apps which disclose the MAC address of a Wi-Fi router that the device is briefly connected to, what can you do with that? So there's a number of uh, companies that run geolocation databases which provide a, a mapping from Wi-Fi router MAC addresses to GPS coordinates. So there's a company called Skyhook, which has been around for a number of years. They have a public API. Um, Apple used to rely on Skyhook until 2010, when, and then Apple started running their own service. Google run a service like this, which is, which is used on Android phones. Um, they had some publicity recently saying, people are saying this is a privacy risk. Um, so Google have actually locked down the API. So you can't query a single MAC address anymore. You have to give two or more MAC addresses which are close to each other before Google will actually return the location. Slide, please. So Apple run their own Wi-Fi location service, which hasn't really been, there's not been a lot of disclosure about it. So. Um, Every iPhone, by default, if you enable this option about sending diagnostics info, will contribute to Apple's database. So if you're just walking down the street, you know, without joining networks, your iPhone will submit information about the Wi-Fi routers it can see, and it'll send the GPS coordinates and the MAC addresses of those routers to Apple, so, and, and, and you're helping Apple build that database. Slide, please. One minute. So when you actually go into Google Maps on your iPhone and it's using Wi-Fi signals to get your location, this is actually what your iPhone sends to Apple. So your iPhone sends a list of saying, okay, these are the Wi-Fi router MAC addresses I can see near me, slide. And this is what comes back from Apple. So I found that you can actually send Apple uh, a single MAC address of a, of a Wi-Fi router and they'll send back a result set of the GPS coordinates of that MAC address and 400 others. Slide, please. So. If you've captured the single MAC address that 30 seconds. somebody has someone's phone's probed for, you can plug that into Apple service through ISMT GPS slide, and you can get very precise information back from that. So um, one more interesting thing, because Apple gives back the uh, full MAC addresses, you can also tell the manufacturer from the OUI. So from the first three octets, you know if um, you can get you know a dump of all the routers Apple has spidered in a certain area, and you can tell it's a D-Link device, it's an Apple device, and so on. So I'm going to do some more research on that and uh, maybe submit a longer talk at a future conference. Thanks. Wow. I, I actually think I let him go 10 seconds over because I forgot to give him his 10-second warning because I was like, what? So another amazing, another amazing lightning talk, tons of amazing lightning talks today. This is just absolutely incredible. And Kupo, you're here. Everybody showed up and everybody not, showed up on time. I better not mess this up, right? This is amazing. All right, last one and then we're out of here. Go, Kupo. So, uh, my name is Kupo or Wo. Uh, you can just call me Jay if you want to see me around the conference. Uh, for the last year, I've been living in Iceland. Uh, and uh, the scene on the ground is much more different than the scene that the uh, press would have you believe. Um, 
So right now in Iceland, uh, a few interesting facts, if you don't know about it, it's got about 300,000 people. It's about the size of Kentucky. Um, it's got a very, very high literacy rate. Uh, it's got the third highest rank in happiness. It's got uh, the most stable parliament. It was formed in 1930, I'm uh, sorry, 930. Uh, oh, slide, by the way. Um, and the economy consists of smelting, tourism, and fishing. That's it. There are no real natural resources in Iceland except for one thing, electricity. Um, it is an EEA member country. It is on the road to EU accession. It may happen, it may not. There are a lot of people that don't uh, want to see it happen. Um, slide. Uh, <clears throat> so, what is IMI? Some of you may remember IMI from about two years ago. Uh, IMI is, it started out as the Icelandic Modern Media Initiative, is now the International Modern Media Initiative. Um, you may have seen Smarty McCarthy walking around today. He's one of the co-founders of IMI. Uh, it covered a whole lot of areas and gaps in Icelandic legislation, and it was, the aim was to, to provide the strongest freedom of speech and uh, freedom of information uh, legislation in the world. Um, so far, it's doing okay. Uh, Friday, they passed uh, a very big improvement to the Freedom of Information Act in Iceland, so that's very good. Um, there's other stuff that still needs to be done. Uh, so, no, so no prior restraint needs to be established, protection of sources, protection of whistleblowers, and especially protection of, of libel uh, lawsuits in Iceland. Slide. So while we were there, we decided that in order to get IMI passed, and because there's a conservative government that's just itching to get back into power, that it was important for us to fight back on not just a technical and not just a legal, but a political level. So we went ahead and formed the Icelandic Pirate Party, uh, and that was on uh, this past November. And uh, we're doing quite well. We've got a pretty good following, um, and that we'll see. It requires some work, and it still requires a lot of uh, information within Iceland, because a lot of people in Iceland have not heard of the Pirate Party which is unusual. Um, MP, uh, the parliamentarian Birgitta Jones' daughter from the movement, uh, who was originally a WL person, uh, is part of the Pirates, uh, and uh, we're putting together our policy framework, um, typical par Pirate Party politics, uh, transparency, accountability, free, uh, direct democracy. Um, we're aiming for 7.3% in the Althingi elections, the parliamentary elections in April, so keep your eyes on us. Um, and we've done pretty well as far, as far as building buzz and explaining to people in Iceland what pirates are about and why they should give, give, a, give a hoot about uh, freedom of speech and uh, especially freedom of speech online. Slide. Uh, so that's one part of the equation. The other part of the equation is Iceland and Iceland's infrastructure. Right now there's four I submarine cables in Iceland. Uh, one is basically unusable. Three are okay, but run to non-low uh, latency connections like Greenland or Denmark or Faroe Islands first. There is less than 3% of the cable capacity in Iceland right now being used, which is ridiculous because people are charging uh, for uh, tiered bandwidth internationally in Iceland. This I hope will change, slide, uh, because this cable should be coming to Iceland within 2014. This is called Atlantic Emerald Express. Danice, the fastest cable connection to Iceland right now is five terabits a second. This is 50 terabits a second. It runs directly from Shirley, New Long Island, New York to Ireland with a spur to Iceland. Slide. Uh, I beat myself, okay. Uh, so uh, pull me aside and talk to me if you want. Uh, my names and my uh, Twitter handle is there. If you want more information, go to Pirata or pirateparty.is. Um, Thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, that is our show. We had two hours and 25 minutes of lightning talks and we ended exactly on time. This has been the most epic session of lightning talks ever. Let's beat it tomorrow. I will see you back here at 1245. Thank you very much.